Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesdays, October 19th, 2021 at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Okay. Mr. Frankel, for the record, he is absent. Ms. Cassell? Here. Mr. Bullsden? Here. Ms. Johnson? Present. Mayor Petrolia? Here. And we will stand for the pledge, please. We can take a, just a moment of silence for the passing of Colin Powell, our secretary of previous or former secretary of state. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, agenda approval. Is there any changes, alterations, comments, concerns about the agenda? No, ma'am. None? Motion to approve the oh, agenda. Oh, oh, I do have one. Sorry. Before you do that, I want to go ahead and remove, just to talk to the commission about uh, 6D, E, and F, just moving that to the regular agenda, just for a brief um, comment or two, not to have any kind of presentation, if that's all right. Sure. All right, so we'll move that to 7AA, so as amended then. Motion to approve as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bulliston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Okay, moving on to 4A, which is presenting of our employee of the month, and we are going to invite Lachey King up. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Commission. I am so excited to be here. I am Lachey King, Human Resources Generalist, and I have a wonderful presentation for you today. Our Employee of the Month is Sandra Cordova, Assistant HR Generalist. Please come up. She has been absolutely amazing. And I'm also going to ask Amanda Scabaris, Clean and Safe Administrator and Dot Pass Assistant HR Director, to come up and tell you all about what she did to deserve this award. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Scabaris. I'm the Clean and Safe Administrator within the Neighborhood and Community Services Department. It is my pleasure today to assist with the presentation for Sandra and to have been able to nominate her for September's Employee of the Month. Since December, she has been assisting the Clean and Safe Division fill an open general maintenance worker position. It's a critical role within a division because it's responsible for 365 day a year litter removal, graffiti rem removal, and landscape maintenance within the downtown corridor. So it's a position that it was much, much uh, needed to be filled throughout the seemingly endless process. She continuously, continuously offered assistance by pre preparing interview packets, conducting interviews based on the complex schedules of many panel members, recruited panel members, and provided information on the interview and onboarding processes as a whole. Finally, in August, eight months after we started the process, she was able to uh, help us successfully hire for the position. In addition to hiring for the clean and safe position, she's been working very closely with our department as a whole for some other divisions that we, or excuse me, for other positions that we have um, open. She exemplifies exceptional service through performance by acting with integrity, being responsible, taking innovative action, and practicing teamwork. And if you know her, you know she has a very infectious smile that lights up a room. I'm very happy to have her on our interview panels because I feel like she's kind of the calm and the storm that many people may feel when they're going through an interview. So I just want to say thank you to Sandra for all her efforts. Fantastic. Good afternoon, Dot Bass Human Resources. I just wanted to add my two cents worth about Sandra. Cannot say enough about 
what she has added to our team, her warmth, her sincerity, yes, her smile, her just her ability to add calm and um, just really a sense of fun to the team. You probably already have heard that she has uh, started here as an unpaid intern and made herself indispensable, became a part-time employee and now a full-time employee. So we are thrilled to have Sandra on our team and appreciate everything she's done for us. So Sandra. It's a great honor to be appreciated and acknowledged by, your, by the team and the family that is Delray Beach. Thank you. I think you should remove your mask and flash everybody a smile. <laughs> So Sandra, on behalf, well no, before I say that, because you're such an excellent employee, on behalf of Mayor Petrolia and the commission, we'd like to present to you this plaque and a certificate for eight hours off with pay. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. We so appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the presentation of the ICMA certificate recognition, and this would be Mr. Terrence Moore. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe not. <laughs> Actually, I'll start first. Okay, there Thank you, you go. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and as clearly stated in the agenda transmittal today, the International City County Management Association is actually recognized in the city of Delray Beach, Florida for its 95th anniversary as being a council manager form of government city. And we are honored this afternoon in that a number of counterparts from various areas of Palm Beach County, South Florida, leadership of local governments, specifically city managers, town managers, and village managers are before you at the podium to offer the presentation on behalf of the International City County Management Association and actually, they are functioning in their capacity as Florida City County Management Association leadership board members, et cetera, beginning with District Representative Christine Thora Skinner of the Village of Golf. She has been serving as the village manager for golf for a little while now. I think we all know who she is, six years, as I recall. Yes, ma'am? Yes, sir. And interestingly enough, I'd like to just briefly share that I appreciate these ladies and gentlemen because as I transition back to Florida as a result of the appointment to the position of Delray Beach, Florida City Manager. These ladies and gentlemen have welcomed me quite nicely, beginning with my first Palm Beach County City Managers Association meeting having taken place Friday, August 27, 2021. A number of people are quite frankly doing a nice job of wishing me very well and offering their best wishes for good luck and prayers, I might add. <laughs> so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate that. Look forward to the continued connection and camaraderie. And this is a great introduction as well by way of the recognition for the city of Delray Beach, Florida. So, Madam Village Manager, if you would please, and feel free to introduce the counterparts who are representing the cause as well today. You did so well, I don't have to say a word. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mayor Petrolia, City Commission, Manager of Moore. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for having us all here today. I am Christine Thrower Skinner, and I've been the manager of the Village of Golf for the last six years. Um, with uh, up in Palm Beach County for the last 16 years, I spent 10 years in West Palm Beach uh, working for them. And uh, I'm here with a few other members of um, the Florida City County Management Association and some other city managers. I'm going to start with Lori Laveria in the purple shirt right there. Lori is the city manager in Boynton Beach, and she is the vice president of the Florida City County Management Association. She'll be the president next year. Um, and we also have <laughs> Andrew McHugh. Andrew is the immediate past president of the Palm Beach County City Management Association, which is a, a title we all covet once we get there. Um, we also have uh, Dale Sugarman, who is retired, and uh, Bob Barzinski, who's also retired, and he was here in Delray Beach for oh, many years as assistant city manager. Is it 20? Was it 20? It was 30. 30. Wow. Amazing. We have Dan Clark, who is the town manager of the town of Lake Clark Shores. And last but certainly not least, Richard Radcliffe, who calls me calls himself our cheerleader because the Florida League of Cities and the Palm Beach County League of Cities work hand in glove with the city managers associations both in the state and here in the county. Uh, we have a very, very active chapter here in Palm Beach County. Um, I, and I would say nearly 
two-thirds of the managers are members and, and regularly participate in our meetings. And it's a wonderful opportunity for managers to share experiences and uh, chew each other's ears and lean on each other's shoulders when they need to and um, really find support among peers, which is kind of challenging in this rather lonesome uh, profession that we have chosen. So, but I'm here on behalf of FCCMA and the International City Management Association to recognize Delray Beach's 95 years. And that may not be how old you are, but it's how long you've been recognized as a city manager form of government. You recognize the importance of having a professional city manager. ICMA recognizes that professional management really does matter, and they encourage cities to make sure that they are hiring people with experience, education, who understand what it takes, the 17 different hats you wear on a daily basis, whether you're in a little tiny village of golf with 300 people or a city of Delray Beach with tens of thousands of people. The job um, pretty much goes 24-7. and. We couldn't do it without the elected officials who represent the residents and the visitors. So we want to thank you, congratulate you. We have a plaque. I'll put my mask back on. We'd love to get a picture. Um, and I don't know if you want to come down here and join us or just stand up where you are and we'll see if somebody can snap a picture of all of us. Maybe what you guys do is back up and then we'll just stand behind you and then that way we can get a full picture. Does that sound good? That sounds terrific. And I just want to say before you leave, thank you all. I mean, you are a distinguished group of um, of colleagues of our city manager and for you to show up um, and the, the word was you know in, in in prayer to help our city manager hopefully hopefully it won't be that much but you know he he's it's great to have the support uh, by each and every one of you for this uh, for our city manager and many of you I know on more of a personal level and I, I just want to say thank you all for coming out it's 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 an honor for you to be here uh, before us so we really appreciate it with Thank the you, award. Mayor. So appreciate it. And Madam Mayor, if I may, I'd like to join my counterparts on the floor as a member of the organization and each of the organizations, actually, Beach some. County, FCCMA, and ICMA. So I think it would be appropriate if I may. Say it again. Oh, absolutely. What Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we'll stand. Yes. It's all right. Yep, I'll just come in. There you go. And Mr. Moore, don't don't take it until Mr. Moore gets down there. He's he's all blocked in. He's blocked in. <laughs> but it's those long legs, the long legs that come into handy. <laughs> Here we go. All right, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, very good. I know. Well, that's what I was saying. <laughs> Very limber. All right, so moving on to the presentation for from the Atlantic High School Student Government Association. Is that uh, Ms. Meeks? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Janet Meeks, and I'm the Education Coordinator for the City of Delray Beach. And today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the new principal of uh, Atlantic High School, um, Sandra Edwards. And she is actually going to be introducing the student um, president of the Student Government Association. And we're presenting this to you this evening as a celebration of our Florida City Government Week. And I'd also like to thank the mayor for her beautiful presentation at Carver Middle School earlier this morning. We had a lot of fun. So much fun. Yeah, we talked with a lot of facts, and the kids were really smart and a lot of fun to be with. So I will hand it over to Sandra. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, um, Ms. Meeks, for the invitation. Uh, Mayor and the City Commission. Hi, my name is Sandra Edwards, and I'm the principal of Atlantic High School. This is my first year as a principal at Atlantic. As the first year principal, I am really excited to be there. However, I am not a new principal. I was the principal at Carver Middle School for three years, which allowed me to know about 60% of my students from Carver Middle that transitioned to Atlantic High School. 
and having relationships with the students makes a huge difference. Atlantic has about 10 academies at the school. We have JROTC, criminal justice, construction, medical, early childhood care, culinary, photography, digital design, drafting and video production, as well as Atlantic has one of the best IB programs in Palm Beach County. Our goal this year is to move Atlantic from a C-rated school to an A-rated school. And in addition, um, which has been one of my biggest pieces there this year, um, because before becoming a, well, when I was a teacher, from a teacher I went to become a guidance counselor. And I just think mental health is so important. And in Atlantic, I've got about six counselors there, and we really do a lot with social and emotional learning. Um, and being that the students came back from remote learning, definitely required us to really pay attention and be intentional about making sure that we take care of students. Um, so this has definitely been a hard year as the students transition back, but we are definitely doing a great job there. Students are great, and I am really excited to be actually still in Delray um, as the principal here. And next, I would like to introduce Eshaw Hawk. She's a little nervous, and she's my SGA president at Atlantic, and she was one of the first students that I actually got to know. Um, just a beautiful young lady that's going to be doing great things there. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce Eshaw Hawk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. It's an honor to be here for uh, Florida City Government Week and celebrating with you guys. Um, so as you know, my name is Ishal Hawk. I am the president of SGA from Atlantic Community High School. I'm currently a senior in the IB program, and I've been in uh, SGA since um, I was a freshman in 2018. Um, so SGA stands for Student Government Association. And as of right now, we are in the midst of planning our um, school's homecoming dance and our spirit week. Uh, in the course of these events and our numerous spirit week activities, SGA hopes to boost Atlantic's morale and overall school spirit. Um, following the two years, these types of activities have not been possible for us to plan. So it's amazing that we do get to, like we have this opportunity now. Um, as a club, we aim to constantly improve school and faculty relationships. As a student body, we show our thanks to staff members and teachers by giving small gifts on certain days throughout the year. We also hope to increase our community outreach by encouraging our members and students to participate in volunteering opportunities. For example, um, just an example, I signed up for um, the moving day, uh, Parkinson's moving day in Palm Beach, and we're going to have our students from National Honor Society and Student Government Association um, volunteer and get that moving. And then we're also going to have students donate uh, items to the Haiti Relief. Uh, and we were also partnering with the National Honor Society for a food drive throughout um, later in the year. Not right now, we have a lot of stuff going on right now, but, yeah. but, later, in the, but later in the year we'll be donating to the Palm Beach County Food Drive. Um, we are constantly on the lookout for new service opportunities and any way to better our community. Like mentioned before, another one of our main goals is to increase school spirit and member motivation by holding many school events. It has been difficult for students all around the state and country during this pandemic and for SGA, but it's very important that we bring the spirit back and give them something to look forward to. Um, we implement good connections as a club by reminding the students of the quality of open-mindedness and always listening to others' opinions and taking that as inspiration or even as constructive criticism. We also aid in the development of citizenship within our students by instilling a sense of interconnectedness and helping them realize that their actions and service and service lead to a betterment of not only the community of Delray Beach, but hopefully other schools in Palm Beach County to encourage other students to become outstanding citizens as well. After two tough years, we know it is finally time to reinvigorate our school spirit and uh, our progress of outreach to schools and communities outside of Delray Beach and improvement within our community as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear about our club as SGA and you know how we do things. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. You did a great job. I'd like, I'd like, to, I'd like, I'd like to inject uh, Principal Edwards. Please bring her back when she's less shy. Oh, please. <laughs> 
did a great job. Nobody, you, you, nobody would know that you were sh you were um, nervous at all. You did no, not at all. So great much. job, great job. Thank you so much, and uh, and we're going to see that we can get that uh, a that C school to an A school. We know that we, you've got it, um, uh, Principal Edwards. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Thank you. All right. Okay, moving on to uh, 7D, which is the um, Community Remembrance Project, and uh, Charlene Farrington is going to uh, present. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. City Commissioner, City Manager, City Attorney, and everyone else on the dais. I appreciate the opportunity to share an exciting project that's underway in Palm Beach County, of which Delray Beach plays a major part. My name is Charlene Farrington. I'm the executive director of Delray Beach's own Spady Cultural Heritage Museum. And with me is Mark Schneider of the ACLU of Palm Beach County. In July 2019, uh, the Palm Beach County Commissioners call for a coalition of diverse community leaders to explore options for claiming the Palm Beach County Monument created by the Alabama-based Equal Justice Initiative and creating a permanent location for that monument here in Palm Beach County. The coalition was formed and is called the Palm Beach County Community Remembrance Project Coalition. Members of the coalition are Dort Miller, Assistant County Administrator of Palm Beach County, Brian Boysaw of Boysaw Law Firm and is the chair of the coalition. Where's the clicker? Where's the clicker? I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Clicker hunt. Click to the right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Uh, Barbara Cheeves of Converge and Associates Consulting, and she's a co-chair of the coalition. Josephine Gahn of the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, who is a co-chair of the coalition. Edith Bush of the Martin Luther King Coordinating Committee of West Palm Beach. Yours truly of the Spady Cultural Heritage Museum, Tammy Fields of Palm Beach County Youth Services, Charles Hagee, Director of the Middle Schools at the Benjamin School, Richard Perry, Entrepreneur, Mark Schneider of the ACLU of Palm Beach County, and Jennifer Cirillo, who's here with us today, of Palm Beach County Parks and Recreation. Hi, Jen. Father Burl Salmon of Bethesda by the Sea served on the coalition in the first year but he has since relocated to Virginia. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama has over 800 steel monuments that memorialize 4,400 known racial terror lynchings in America just between 1877 and 1950. I hope it's okay if I pull this down a little sure. bit. It's yes, really weird can. talking with the mask on. Uh, Florida reported 318 lynchings during that time, two of which occurred here in Palm Beach County. Samuel Nelson was lynched September 26, 1926, same year the Spady Museum <coughs> House was built. He had been jailed in Delray and charged with an attempted criminal assault of a white woman in Miami. The steel doors of his jail cell had been battered open and his body was found riddled with bullets next to a canal west of town. Henry Simmons was lynched June 7, 1923. A white police officer claimed he, the officer, was attacked and shot by three black men, so a lynch mob was formed and began hunting black men. Mr. Simmons was a married 39-year-old man who was dragged from his home in the northwest neighborhood of West Palm Beach, and his body was found several hours later riddled with bullets and hanging from a tree. He was the second black victim of that mob that morning. Police stated neither man was a suspect. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, bringing one of those memorials here to Palm Beach County is a complicated process that involves a lot of back and forth with the Equal Justice Institute uh, initiative. So there are three phases before we can bring one of those memorials here. The first is that we've got to start education about this project and racial terror lynchings in the United States and Palm Beach County and outreach to the community. Then the second phase is soil collection at the sites where the lynchings occurred. And then we're going to ask that historical markers be considered. 
So we've begun the process of community engagement already. We are having a lecture series coming out of the library. We're going to have community conversations between members of our group and different communities. Uh, we're going to have an essay contest that high school students are going to be asked to participate in. Uh, art contests, those are for spring 2022 and much, much more. So our, in, our intention is to really engage the Palm Beach County community in this project of bringing the memorial here. So there are movies like Just Mercy that we're, we'll be showing. We'll have uh, readings of books in the libraries and we'll be engaging students in the public uh, schools of Palm Beach County. Here's what the soil collection looks like. There are jars with the names of each of the lynched individuals on them. We're going to go to the sites either where they were taken from or where, there, where their bodies were found or both, collect soil there and then we ship that up to the uh, National Memorial in Montgomery where they will be put on permanent display. And it's at this point that we really want to engage the community. We want community members to be there. We'll have speeches, uh, we'll, we'll tell the story of each individual who is lynched, and then we will collect the soil samples. So our first initiative is the soil collection project, and we've got to engage communities in this. Here's the site at the uh, corner of Atlantic and Sims Road where we have determined that uh, Samuel Nelson's body was found, and that's a possible site for soil collection. Now, the second, the, the final phase before the actual monument would be delivered to Palm Beach County is to put up historical markers for each of the lynchings. And these markers, the text of which will be decided between our group and the Equal Justice in Initiative. Um, and one of these obviously is going to be situated, we hope, with your permission, somewhere here in Delray Beach. Now, the site of the jail was 14 Southeast Fifth Avenue. The jail was there, the, uh, the city council chambers there was there, the city hall was there, and the fire department was there. Currently, there is no address 14 Southeast Fifth Avenue, fortunately, because I don't think any business owner would want to have the address of, of where this occurred. And I'm showing you here on the, the left side the narrow uh, strip of, of land between the sidewalk and the street on the west side of the street, which is where 14 would have been. There's a 12 southeast and a 20 southeast mm -hmm. uh, Fifth Avenue right now. And then the right-hand picture is across the street from that, which looks to me to be a more appropriate place potentially to put a historical marker. It might be necessary for people to be able to read it well to remove one of the palm trees that's there. That would be up to you if you thought that this was a suitable site. But the first thing that we need to ask you for is for your consideration of where you think a historical marker, should you join this project, where it would be best situated in Delray Beach. We might ask for a second marker up at Sims and Atlantic Avenue. Uh, we'll have to see about that, but one should be probably near the site where the person was abducted downtown because that would get the most traffic. Okay, so we've made a lot of progress thus far, and I'll return it to Charlene just to tell you what we've been doing. Okay. So um, you've heard about the potential projects that are coming up. Um, we would like to engage as much of the community as we can possibly engage in those projects. Um, our timeline looks like this, just to review. Um, that's not the right slide, but let me just tell you quickly. In 2019, the county commissioners issued the directive to form the coalition and submitted an expression of interest to the Equal Justice Initiative. In uh, June 2020, Palm Beach County Community Remembrance uh, Coalition was formed. 
in July 2021, Equal Justice Initiative got back to us and accepted our expression of interest. And um, the coalition then developed a website, a logo, and formed the Education and Community Engagement Subcommittee. And the subcommittee developed and submitted a plan to EJI in August. So our next steps, uh, continue our outreach to the families of the victims and to interested stakeholders of Palm Beach County, such as yourselves, solidify a fiscal sponsor for the project. Once the education and community engagement plan is accepted by EJI, launch those activities that were just explained, including the essay contest, plan a commemorative 100 year event anniversary, and our ultimate goal is to bring the memorial to Palm Beach County. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That Absolutely. was a great uh, presentation. I have a question for you. Yes. Obviously, so this is a, we're trying to get, if I'm understanding this correctly, um, some recognition for the two uh, gentlemen back in the 1920s Correct. to have uh, jars of the soil, soil and also a hanging, I guess they would make one of those for these guys too? Yep. So we would want the jars of soil and the historic marker for okay. each of the gentlemen. Right. The, the monument, there's only one for Palm Beach County. Oh, I got you. Okay, so yeah. each of those that were hanging, ha or, or particular counties where these atrocities had happened. Correct. Okay, and so if we're doing that, um, is are these the only two in Palm Beach County that we Bet know of? Between 1877 and 1950. Okay. Certainly not the only two in Palm Beach County. But that's the time period that EJI researched when they put this project together. Okay, so what you're saying is prior to that, there were many more and potential. Since then, there, there could have been. Since 1950? Yes. Really? Okay. The research continues. Gotcha. All right, very good. So we have one that's specific to Delray Beach and Correct. being at the... All right. Yes. That answers my questions. I just kind of wanted to understand it better. Do we have any other questions for from the commission? I'd just like to thank you for the effort, and I'm so proud that Palm Beach County is stepping forward, and I'm hoping that the citizens of Delray Beach will appreciate the history, and if we don't know our history, we're bound to repeat it. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, I presume we will have further conversations about this as time goes on. All right. Very yes, good. <coughs> All right. So at this point, we are going to go to the um, comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda items from the public. And we'll start with the city manager for any response to prior public comments or inquiries. Actually, no other responses to prior public comments at this time. However, I'd like to briefly discuss 5A1 and 5A2, if I may be permitted. Mm -hmm. And I wish to do so at this time simply because a commitment was made by the Office of the City Manager and likewise other executive leadership team meetings members, uh, pardon me, to provide an update in terms of traffic calming and speed bump installation process, direction and guidance to that effect, as well as a summary relative to current construction projects and resulting inconveniences that may be experienced throughout the community. And the latter item, of course, I envision us making this a feature of future meetings going forward, if you will, because of course, Derry Beach is in the process of experiencing a number of projects, initiatives, and getting us to a place in which we can implement improvements. And of course, there may be some inconveniences along the way as we proceed accordingly. So with that, I've asked Director of Public Works, Missy Barletto, to assist in, in both forms of communication, and I'm asking her to offer a brief update sure. so as to, pr so as to pr respond as committed. So if I, I may, ladies and gentlemen. for Missy. She's going to do a little presentation first, then you can be one of the first ones coming up. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. Missy Barletto, Public Works Director. So when uh, I can't really resist a moment of public education when it falls in my lap this easily. So this first slide, um, I wanted to point out to you the difference between five miles an hour mm. in driving speed. So if you take a look at the picture up there, if you were driving at 30 miles an hour and you slammed on your brakes, right? you would stop just at the toes of the first child that says not here. If you were driving 35 miles an hour, you would go through the first child, you would go through the second child, 
and you would stop right before the third child, 96 feet later. This is the reason that we need traffic calming and why people ask us to do it on a regular basis. So what is traffic calming? 99.9% .9 of the requests we get when people call in and ask for traffic calming in their neighborhood are for speed bumps because that is the most common thing that people look at and think of as, as traffic calming. But it actually is anything that involves a change in street alignment, um, installation of barriers, physical me measures that are not limited to, to just impediments to driving more quickly. They can be visual barriers that, that cause people to think, oh, there's something in the road up here, I need to slow down, right? So these things are our speed tables and speed humps are the most, most common, raised crosswalks, raised intersections. Um, chicanes, we have a number of those in several of our neighborhoods. We're installing those now in the Osceola Park neighborhood and some in the Southwest neighborhood. And at the next meeting, we're gonna be talking more about the kinds of things that we'll be implementing in the Northwest neighborhood. Um, neighborhood roundabouts, signage and striping, medians, trees and landscaping, and traffic circles. All of these are common types of, of traffic calming. Um, in the pictures up here, you'll see two different things that are actually here in Del Delray Beach. The bottom picture is a speed hump in the Tropic Isles neighborhood, I mean Tropic Palms neighborhood. If you've ever driven over those, those are major speed bumps. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Along Lindell. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. In the, um, you can see across the top of them where the cars have bottomed out on them often enough they've scraped off the top of them. Mm -hmm. um, in the top photo above that that shows the picture of the ambulance, those are the speed cushions that we are installing more regularly now. If you notice that they come in sets of three, the the two um, blank spaces in between the speed cushions are actually designed for the wider wheelbases and ambulances and fire trucks to prevent um, pain to a patient that's being transported. That's one of the, the biggest complaints about speed humps or speed bumps. Mm -hmm. So the city of Delray Beach has a long established process for how to ask for and receive traffic calming in your neighborhood. Um, I'm gonna run through it super quickly right here, but you can also go to the website under government to public works department. On the left-hand side, there's a dark blue um, line of things, choose transportation and traffic. And from there, you'll see the traffic calming, and it outlines this process there for anybody who wants to look it up later online. So these requests are, are generally, they're either initiated by signed petitions from the residents. We ask that 66% or two-thirds of the residents in any affected area agree to these measures so that we are making sure that we're not um, creating barriers for people that, that are not in favor of it. And then we also define the neighborhood boundaries, which typically those boundaries can go beyond a normal neighborhood boundary or what is normally, re, um, normally um, looked at as the boundaries of a particular neighborhood. It may cross those lines and go into other areas. So once we have received the request from the, from the public, we begin evaluation. We start by the, with a citizen meeting. We call everyone in. We talk to them about the types of, of speed, speed um, barriers and ask them uh, what they envision for their neighborhood. And then we begin to collect the appropriate data. We put traffic counts out. We, we count the number of, of cars that pass in a general area per day. The traffic volume is important. We look at the speed profile collected over a 10-day period. We look at the crash history, the existing facilities. Are there sidewalks in this area? Are there not sidewalks? Are there schools? Are there churches? Are there parks that are, are attractors to, to um, pedestrian traffic? And, um, and then we start to design. We look at the, we 
whether or not this speed um, traffic calming is justified. That's what I was trying to say. So the first thing we do, we evaluate, and you'll hear us say this all the time, we evaluate against the 85th percentile benchmark. So that's, that's a complicated data set to, to explain to you, but very, very simply, that is the speed at which 85% of the cars in a particular area feel that it is comfortable and safe to drive, right? If that 85th percentile benchmark falls five miles an hour over the speed limit or greater than that, then traffic calming is warranted in that area. If it falls beneath that, traffic calming is not warranted in that area. You can count on about 15% of the people to speed all the time. You're always going to have that outlier no matter what kind of, of impediments to speeding that you put in a place. You're always going to have that outlier person who's going to drive extremely fast through a neighborhood. And those, those become law enforcement issues. Okay, we only do them on two-lane streets. We avoid evacuation routes or emergency routes. We avoid truck routes. We, um, we consider the impact on neighboring streets. If we put traffic coming on this street, is that going to create a problem on the street next door? And we also consider the impact on emergency operations. Um, one of the, I already talked about the problem with ambulances, but speed humps are also extremely diff, are extremely hard on all of our heavy equipment, especially the specialized equipment like police units and, and fire trucks. So once we've determined that it is, it is uh, warranted to put traffic calming in an area, if it is just the speed cushions that we showed before, signage and striping, we can install that with city crews relatively quickly. If it is a more complex solution, um, traffic roundabouts, raised intersections, um, raised um, tabled crosswalks, or chicanes or landscape nodes, then those are built into um, capital projects that would come in the future. Are there any questions about traffic calming and how we determine? The only question or the only concern that I have is that I, I'm not so sure that we get the actual speed in certain areas when you have the big, um, you know, the, the big uh, uh, speed, you know, regulator that shows you how fast you're going. And if that's how we're gathering our information, you're probably getting a much lower um, speed. And I know that we've had that happen in certain areas. and. There was no determination needed because the speed was lowered, but it's because people see it and then they slow down. And then once it's recorded, it's not really recording what is happening when there is nothing there. So that would be my only concern that are we really getting good data back? So there are a couple of different ways that we measure that. Okay. One way we put the little tubes out across the, the road and almost everybody knows what those tubes are nowadays and they slow down. The police department also has a stealth method where we can just put a little machine out that you will not notice and it tracks how fast the cars are going and how many cars go by. So there's more than one way Perfect. to uh, to gather that data. Okay. That, that, that makes me feel better because I just would hate to see certain areas that really need it not getting it because people are slowing down. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation. I just have two questions. How often are your uh, calming humps checked for the wear and tear? Specifically, I'm asking about those that are installed on Southwest 12th Avenue, directly in front of the Village Academy uh, School. The last time I was there, they were rather ragged. Okay. And we'll take a look so at that. Do you have some kind of, uh, do you wait for people to tell you or? No, ma'am. I know that the, the streets department goes by and takes a look regularly. Okay. Um, but I don't know about that particular one and I will know by tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you. Uh, secondly, there was a meeting with the, uh, with Chief Chavarro Sims and, uh, the residents of South of a Southwest, uh, neighborhood 
I think it's called Carver Estates. That's just west of Village Academy. So that would be 13th, 14th, and maybe 15th. Carver Park. Co College? Carver Park. Carver Park, thank you. Um, don't know, I know that the last time I was involved, we were going to put some kind of gauge. I don't know if your stealth gauge was used, but uh, I, I never heard back. And We actually did traffic selectives. You can come to this one. Yeah. She sounds PD. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually conducted traffic selectives, but the issue you have with traffic selectives, we're visible. So when we're visible, quite naturally, traffic slows. And the stealth method that Missy is, uh, has mentioned, uh, there, is a, there is equipment of that nature that's, that's out there, but we don't possess it. The thing that we have is visible, will be visible to the uh, travelers. Is this rather expensive equipment, I suppose? Uh, 25 grand, give or take, yeah. For just one? I yes. mean, I don't know. Yes. Okay. Well, now that we've outed you, I'm <laughs> I don't know what's in the budget. We just finished our budget. I, I think I get complaints. In fact, this afternoon I spent about an hour speaking with Mr. Williams of uh, Northwest Third, Third, Third uh, Avenue, and that was his big complaint that uh, we have so. I shouldn't say we we have specific areas where you come out of the neighborhoods, and Third is the first one you can come out to get onto Lake Ida, and the uh, subdivision we were just talking about, that's one of the exits to get on to 10th. So everyone's seen the beautiful installation on Northwest 3rd Avenue, and everybody wants that beautiful stop sign, and they want those humps because they think that's the only way because we don't have enough personnel. And I have one issue, I'm sandwiched between the uh, Spady Museum and the Child Achievement Center, and don't get in their way if it's six o'clock because every minute they're late picking up their child, that's another dollar out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. I think it's ten dollars. I don't. I can imagine them trying to get there before six, and if you're running late. So Fourth Avenue is now a throughway, and it's also one of the last opportunities to get out onto Lake Ida uh, on the fifth. So well, unfortunately, traffic selective is only a band aid. I'm sorry only a band-aid. Traffic selectors is only a band-aid. Right. We need to find more of a permanent solution to the issue and I think traffic calming uh, devices would be, I guess, assist a great deal in that effort. Everyone always wonders why there's one on Northwest 10th Avenue between uh, Martin Luther and 1st in Atlantic. All of a sudden, someone moved into the neighborhood, and all of a sudden, their traffic calming. So everyone wanted to know how that happened. I have no idea. Um, I have to find out how it happened myself. I'd love to have one at 8th Avenue Northwest and uh, maybe 7th, and then again at 6th, and then again at 5th. So it's just a, it's a throughway. It's a throughway. Yes. Right, November so 2nd, we're going to bring you that study. And we're going to show you yeah. all the things that are, are uh, have been developed for Northwest Neighborhood. Very good. Thank you so much. So anything else? No, all right, moving you, on. Missy, Missy? your next um, item here, uh, construction projects. Um, yeah, next presentation, please. Okay. I thought we were doing public comments after this. Yeah. Thank Here's you, Chief. another presentation first. Sean. Next presentation, Okay, the, the other regular information that you've asked us for are those active construction projects that interrupt traffic flow. So, so this, we're gonna really fly through this presentation too, I hope. Um, so the information 
that is in this presentation in the future will be attached to each commission agenda. Yes, ma'am. So you'll have a two-week look ahead all the time at exactly how many um, both public and private construction um, projects are going on out there that will be interrupting traffic. So besides this particular form of communication, we communicate these issues in a number of different ways. They're listed on our city website. They're, we put out variable message boards, the, the flashing light boards. I know that they're out in our, in our community all the time and people stop reading them at some point, but they are out there two weeks before the onset of construction to let people know. Um, we hold for, for public projects, we hold public meetings for before the design begins, after the design is completed, and before we begin construction. We do personal outreach to residents, we send letters, we do door hangers, and then we also communicate to, to folks through our, our partners at the DDA and the CRA. So right now we have a few city projects that, that are interrupting the flow of things for us. The first one is Atlantic Dunes Park where we're replacing the seawall in the north parking lot currently. When we complete the seawall in the north parking lot, we'll reopen that parking lot to the public for them to be able to park there and we will move to the south parking lot and block that one off. And those each will be maybe about six, six months in duration. We're doing a stormwater project on Southeast um, 8th Court in the Del Rio neighborhood. That roadway is restricted to local traffic only. The Brant Drive Bridge that's in the Tropic Palms neighborhood was an, in serious disrepair. It is being completely demolished and replaced. That bridge will be out of service for approximately a year. Mm -hmm. And folks in that area have to, have to either travel east or west to get out to a major artery in order to get around instead of cutting through the neighborhoods. George Bush Boulevard is one of our TPA grant funded projects. We're completely redoing the roadway, water sewer, some of the um, some of the sidewalks, putting in decorative lighting that um, for the next couple of weeks, actually for the next couple of months, that construction is going to be restricted to between west of the FEC railroad tracks and northeast second avenue. May I there. ask? May I ask before you go? I don't know if I, when I go into this uh, site, mm -hmm. I'll see dates because I don't see any dates here on your presentation. I don't see dates. That would be helpful. Okay. I'll make sure we add that to future, future documents. Thank you. So, and just so long as with the, the caveat that the dates are our our best guess at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, in the Southwest neighborhood, we have ongoing construction on Southwest 4th Street, Southwest 6th Street, Southwest 7th Avenue, and Southwest 3rd Court. Again, we're doing full roadway and sidewalk reconstruction and some, um, some lighting. We do not anticipate any complete roadways being blocked during that time, but you may experience some single lane blockages, and there will be flaggers present to um, <coughs> to get you around the construction area during those times. Um, also in the, the Southwest neighborhood, we're doing some, um, we're doing the implementation of our ADA transition plan where we're, we're creating more pedestrian mobility by replacing gaps in sidewalks, replacing sidewalks where the slopes are incorrect or they're unsafe for handicapped persons. And uh, those streets that are, that are there are listed here in the presentation, and these impacts are only to pedestrians in this part of Southwest neighborhood. And we're also going to be getting the, the reclaimed area 10 construction that is right here around this, this area, sort of, um, in the Southeast and Northeast 4th Avenue from Southeast 4th Street to Northeast 2nd Street and Northeast 2nd Avenue and Southeast 1st Street. So there will also be intermittent lane closures with flaggers there, but there won't be any complete road closures. 
for city construction projects, that's it for right now, for the next two weeks. We All have right, more coming. Good. Any other questions? No. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now we will move on to um, comments by um, the public. If you'd like to step up, make sure that you've signed in. You'll have three minutes. State your name and address. Good, good evening, Montre Bennett, 323 Northwest 2nd Avenue. I would like to know when are the meetings being held for those traffic situations. Second, I put in a email to the city about traffic issues. I never heard anything back. All right, I'm gonna repeat myself. When are the meetings held for the traffic issues? I put in an email, secondly, for traffic issues in Northwest 3rd Street, 5th Avenue, 4th Avenue, in the whole 3rd Street should all be four-way stops, invisible stop signs. Northwest 4th Avenue is a full drive-through street with a blind man in that street and cars fly by like they are on NASCAR. Um, I ride bikes and scooters and walk with my son constantly to keep him active and I just don't like it. I already lost a son to a car accident. Nextly, as a resident and a future business owner, the entertainment district should be extended to at least I-95 or Fifth Avenue so that all businesses can reap the benefit so that their customers can be satisfied and happy. My name is Montre and I am complete. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey guys, um, I'm Max, 1705 Northwest 4th Ave. Um, Last name, Max. Oh, Max Zengage. I uh, completely support what Issa said about that four-way stop should be everywhere on that road. Um, also on that, I frequent a friend's um, property right at Northeast 3rd and Swinton. And there are, there's already existing uh, traffic calming there, but the crashes are insane there. Um, I am the vice chair of the public art board for Delray. I'm here to present on Delray buggies. We're launching a golf cart mural tour, uh, arts and culture tour from Space of Mind. So Ali Kaufman. Um, it's all about the community. We're tying in all the nonprofits, community businesses, um, a Spady Museum. We've been working for months now with the DDA. They just launched the uh, Delray Art Trail, which is an amazing interactive uh, inventory of public art in the city. Um, we were directly involved in helping Maruska with that, and she's awesome. Uh, so <laughs> kudos to Maruska for completing that and launching it. Um, we are here as on behalf of Mr. Moore uh, to request to be on the November 9th uh, commission workshop for an LDR amendment. Um, a little bit about Delray Buggies is we are partnering with Winwood Buggies down in Winwood, Miami. Um, it's a partnership with Community Classroom Project, which is from Space of Mind, and we're going to have an equity partner from that uh, nonprofit. So that way, 20% of all rides and sponsorships will support scholarships for the Northwest and Southwest neighborhoods. And, and the youth to come on the tours and really educate everyone about public art. Um, what else about this? There's so much about this. Um, launching from Space of Mind, it's an educational campus and creative community. It's a center in the art, Old School Square Historic Arts District, and it's gonna be amazing with a variety of tours, uh, art appreciation tours, art experience tours, a scavenger hunt, themed holiday tours. Um, the route will be very similar because we do have existing murals and sponsoring businesses that uh, already host murals on their, their uh, properties. Um, and then we'll have like a, you know, a private tour option. Keep it exciting for locals. We also want to encourage um, a pre-order thing for locals. That way they have their reserved tours. Um, it's, it's going to be amazing, complimentary with the Dari Art Trail. Uh, oh, another thing I wanted to add about the um, historic Lynch uh, sign. 
Go ahead, questions. quickly. Okay. Um, being part of the family at La Sorelle, which was on that picture with the yellow tables mm -hmm. outside, I think right around that corner, there's a piece of uh, dirt and it's not been landscaping. It's not, landscaping has not been put in in a mm -hmm. long time. Um, I think that's a perfect spot for the sign. So be involved when they when they start bringing that around. Thank okay. you, Max. Yep. Could I just ask a question? Max, you said buggy. You're talking about golf carts? Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, it's an LDR amendment. We've been in uh, frequent communication with all the city departments, uh, economic development, planning, um, Duncan. Uh, all right, <laughs> thank you, Max. Department. Yes, sir. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Just to clarify, and you actually touched on a comment that I was planning to offer regarding the LDR amendment consideration because you had been involved in discussions with leadership and development services, economic development regarding this particular possibility. And the opportunity to evaluate or review the, the merits of a land LDR amendment as it, are, as it is necessitate some 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 thought at this particular level so I would be comfortable evaluating the men the, the merits of an LDR approach in this regard and to come back with recommendations prospectively that approach likewise would not necessitate a workshop meeting as we just described it and put it together so if we can proceed via the office of the city manager working with development services and all others involved to fully evaluate this particular consideration regarding the necessary ODR adjustment, <clears throat> we can go from there. And I'm not sure what the specific time frame is associated with your planned event mm -hmm. because an LDR process is a exercise. Yes, it is. It takes time to go about that direction and to offer recommendations accordingly. So I offer that background so as to not create a sense that something will be expedited to enable an event to take place because an LDR process is a fair amount of time to, to enable the Department of Development Services and other departments involved to consider a recommendation in that regard. However, I would feel comfortable as your city manager offering direction to that effect, notwithstanding any planned event that you may be anticipating soon. Mr. Moore, um, one of your department uh, heads would like to speak to a commit, I mean, a city, man, a city attorney. Yes, want to add to that? So i not trying to be difficult, but we did just adopt um, Section 2.4.5M, which requires a privately initiated text amendment to be brought before you through a workshop, workshop. process. Right. And so, um, you know, I hesitate um, not following our new process because it is brand new and we don't want to create exceptions to the rule. So the next workshop is in, in about two and a half, three weeks. Um, you know, it would just require um, this gentleman to make a 10 minute presentation. If he can get one sponsorship, then at that point he would submit his application to the city. So we haven't accepted his application with the text <coughs> amendment. Staff hasn't had an opportunity to analyze that. And that text amendment, depending on you know, which boards are necessitated for review. It's clearly gonna to have to go before the Planning and Zoning Board. It may have to go before the Historic Preservation Board, depending. So there is a bit of a process. So I, I understand um, he's anxious to commence this um, exciting new adventure, but I do think we need to follow our process because it is brand new. It was actually adopted right before you came. Of course, and I understand that. And quite frankly, I do recognize that, ladies and gentlemen, and that's the basis of my comments about the lengthy steps in the process associated therein. However, that feature was incorporated right before my arrival. But I did have an opportunity to study it after learning about your, your interests in that regard. So that's an excellent addition to the comments I've offered City Attorney Jellin so that we can offer direction. We'll let you guys there. figure it out and get it back to us. And, and I don't know if the, um, the first step is the um, workshop, workshop and then after that you've got the, um, the responsibility of figuring out how this would work within our LDRs, but you, I'm sure you got it handled. To clarify on both of their points, we have been in constant contact, uh, very yep. thorough contact. I do have a bachelor's in urban planning. I have a master's in real estate development. Right very familiar with the public planning so process. So Max, this isn't the time to like have no, a back and forth. No, so no, no. we're they'll, they'll be we're in touch with you. We're, we're good. Aware of that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to make a real quick announcement. Our water is back on. So if anybody needs to use our facilities, they're available.
Hi, everybody. Marjorie Waldo, uh, 316 Northwest 2nd Street. I am representing Arts Garage and some amazing community members today. Um, can I give you my presents? Yes, you may. Just hand I'm going to pass the, them uh, right around to you, yeah. please, ma'am. I left one for you as well. Um, so Arts Garage met with Glace and Leroy years ago when I first started. And in that time frame, I've also spoken with Mayor Petrolia. I've spoken with Julie. I've talked to Ryan through Facebook. And I know that somebody else I know has spoken with Shirley Johnson about the idea of beautifying the garage that is the um, that Arts Garage sits beneath, right? So inside your package is my manipulation of the system because I couldn't get on the agenda for a presentation quickly enough. So the presentation is there. I'm going to email it to you as well. I want to just garner your support. I'm not asking you to do anything today. On behalf of Arts Garage, the Delray Beach Police Department, including Sergeant Schmidt and Officer Perez, Glace and Leroy, um, Eduardo Mendieta, Nancy Channon, and Jack Schulman, who rallied on Facebook to create a mural project proposal for the Arts Garage. We want for the, <laughs> sorry, for the parking garage that Arts Garage sits in it. Um, so we want the mural to go from the floor to the ceiling on both the north um, west corner stairwell, all five floors. It would start underwater and end up in the bright Florida sky. So it would be Village by the Sea theme. Um, on the southeast stairwell, it would be art and music for the Pineapple Grove. And as you exit the southeast stairwell, you would walk out and the wall that is the opposite side of my office at Arts Garage would be a huge map of Delray Beach that would include, for example, the monuments that you're talking about um, with the Remembrance Project or the Spady location, the Historical Society location. Old School Square is a designated um, historical site and any others in the city, as well as our beautiful beach and City Hall and the police department. So um, we would love to be able to do that. We have people organized, and uh, Ms. Chandon has already made a pledge of $5,000. I am going to be asking you for money and the CRA for money if you want to see this happen, because it's about 34 grand, which is not a lot for the type of space we're talking about. Um, I would love a conversation with the city manager's office at some point, whoever is appropriate, um, to see maybe how we can collaborate on it. But I think it would do nothing but beautify the city. It would allow us to um, do what um, Sergeant Schmidt calls crime prevention through environmental design. Um, which I gave you some information about. And can I just say one more sentence? Please. I'll hurry. So we have tried to tie in equity to this as well so that the artists involved are layered in terms of their experience. Two curators, five experienced established mur muralists, three emerging muralists, and an application process for students who might want to participate. 25% female artists and 50% non-white artists. Thank you. So we hope that you'll consider the project. All right. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, guys. Sir? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rich Pollock, 5143 Cleveland Road, Delray Beach. I'm here to thank you. Um, on behalf of Delray Reads Day, I want to thank you all for the support that we've been getting over 10 years. It, it's hard to believe that it's been 10 years when we started. Um, if you go back, when we started, our goal was really simple. We wanted to get people into the schools mm -hmm. and to see how good our teachers and our educators are because there was so many disbelief and there's so many rumors. So that was our initial goal and it was to bring the community together. And if you think about it, there's no other place in Palm Beach County that could bring a community together like Delray. We had 250 people sign up the first year and we had waiting lists every year since. Unfortunately, this year, because of the pandemic, we're going virtual again. Um, so that's gonna hurt us in, in that goal of bringing the community together. But there was a second goal and it was to show how much Delray Beach cares about our teachers and our educators. So uh, you won't find Boca or, or Boynton doing what we do. So this year, because we're in a pandemic, we're going to be giving books to uh, pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade in every elementary school in the city. And we're also going to be doing something, and Mayor, thank you very much for helping with this. Um, the mayor is going to do a video 
<laughs> and we're going to have that video on our website. And we're also going to be asking everybody to read to a kid. If you have time, just read to a kid this year. And our goal, our hope, uh, by the way, I should tell you what the book is. The book is called Amy Wu and the Patchwork Dragon. And Delray Reads Day this year is October 28th. And um, I know there's a proclamation coming, and I want to thank you for that. And again, thank you all for your support. Hopefully we'll be in the schools next year. And nobody's allowed to freeze frame my uh, readings on v video and, and, and snapshot those and put them out there. But anyway, um, that's for another day. Well, thank we have you plenty so of much. pictures of you from years past. There you go. <laughs> thank you. All right. 80, 80 cards, come on. <laughs> Anyone else? He's coming up. Oh, here, oh, this is the voice of reason. we got to listen now. Yeah. Take my time. I'm old now. George Long, voice of reason and impartial observer of municipal government in action. First of all, I want to thank you. Oh, the, the golf carts. What a good idea that is. I, I can't. This is a really good idea, but that's enough said on that. Uh, I wanted to uh, compliment you. Thank you for doing the, um, approving the, um, the grant for the uh, catching the cats you, you cannot imagine and i know doreen and cindy just briefly from me trying to catch a few they must have caught hundreds uh how much trouble that really is i mean what what a job how dedicated they are and the effort that goes into that the trips to peggy adams and stuff back and forth um now while i'm saying good things um i've been looking at some of your staff reports i have no life so i read these things actually about your uh before these meetings and they are wonderful they are, they are so good the the way they uh, uh outline everything that's taken place in the different meetings and how the and the historic preservation they go into the history of the different houses they're talking about going to the sandborn maps and things like that and it looks like you've got something similar coming with these construction reports but if these um uh staff reports uh, are not being used for uh, assignments at an urban development course. They should be. They're just really good. If was there something else, there was probably something good else to say, but it's too late. I can't read my own writing. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you, Mr. Voice of Reason. Thank you, George. It's Pauline Moody. Yes, Shelley Petrolia. Your girl's back. Hi, Miss Pauline Moody, 609 Southwest 8th Avenue, Derry Beach, Florida. And I'd like to discuss something that happened to me recently. Here's a police report. Uh, and I'm into this into record, her lovely clerk here. And I had a copy for Lynn too, and I took pictures. I had an incident over on Lindale at where, over Lakes of Del Lake of Delray, where city does own half of the complex there. And the food truck that goes there, Harvest Fresh, well, there was an incident, you know, the criminal activity, you all know me well, and I'm not going to go. It's free food, but I'm denied free food from a truck that's bringing food there, okay? The people there are atrocious, but it's just a truck, okay? Here we have an incident, and I did speak up about it because they had one person that lived out there who had COVID, but the proper protocol was not taken. Okay, and since the housing authority owns the half of the complex out there, we have a situation where I would be no trespass from coming out there on the city half of the property, which was at the, excuse me, <coughs> the free food was in, never in the clubhouse. They have it on tables in front of the clubhouse, and you just pick it up and go. Where I would come on the bus palm trend the 88 because that's the only one that goes past there and this happened september 29th 2021 where i stood to wait and they told me i couldn't get anything they snatched the book that you signed away from me and i'm looking i'm like this i i waited in line patiently before i have been hit i had injuries on my stomach which i can't photograph and give to you and the people that go out there, they don't live out there. But they come out there because they got relatives that live out there. And Pastor Rose is the black pastor that's in charge. But she, you know, her ex-husband lives out there. But we have a situation where even though she was controlling the food, that I would be denied. And you know me and the city well. I'm going to bring it to you because 
I sustained injuries out there on the property. I've had my foot run over on that property. And, of course, you know, Derry Police Department is never going to write a police report that vindicates and says I was injured. But whatever they do do, I bring to you because they are your employees and they work under the city manager now. But as a Derry resident, once again, I'm injured again on city property. First, it was the Karen Kitchen and Knife incident. We all know how that, okay? This is the city that's disorganized. Homelessness, all these little projects you have, the city's a mess. But I wanted to bring this to your attention. And I did make a copy for the lovely Lynn and the city manager. If you don't mind, I want to hand it to them. No, you can, oh, you can? Hand, it, hand it to the uh, clerk. Oh, okay. Okay, and then we'll get it back down. We'll get all it right. to them. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. much. Anyone else? Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public comments. And we are moving on to the consent agenda. And there's going to be one read of a proclamation. But other than that, um, just uh, just approve it as amended. Motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Okay. okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Oh, he's absent. Ms. Cassell? Yes. All right, so we have a very exciting um, uh, proclamation, and this has to do with our, um, our Atlantic High School. We are um, doing Atlantic High School Day, and I'm going to read the proclamation into the record. They are having their uh, 50th anniversary, I'm sorry, reunion um, for uh, uh, the class of 1971. So whereas the city of Boyne Beach and Delray Beach had two public high schools until 1970, and whereas the two public high schools were Carver High School, which housed all of the African-American students in Seacrest High, and whereas the designation of Palm Beach County Public Schools happened gradually from 1961 to 1973. And whereas Seacrest High School had been integrated since 1961, where Miss Yvonne Odom was first, the first Ameri African American to attend. And whereas a committee representing both schools met in 1969 in an effort to set guidelines to advance the operational development of the two schools. And whereas the selection committee narrowed the two schools names down to Atlantic High and Gulfstream High, and by a majority vote, Atlantic High was selected. And whereas in 1970, Atlantic High School was created. Whereas the school colors remained green and white from Seacrest High School, since many students could not afford to purchase the new uniforms, the school mascot was adopt, uh, accepted from Carver High School, which is the Eagle. And whereas Atlantic High School's first graduating class of 1971, with 443 students strong, have had numerous successful and renowned student and staff accomplishments and has become an international baccalaureate school. Not, now, therefore, I, Shelley Petrolia, Mayor of the City of Delray Beach, on behalf of the City Commission, do hereby declare the last Friday in October as Atlantic High School Day and encourage the community to join in the celebration of Atlantic High School's 50th anniversary and recognize the accomplishments and contributions made to this community uh, and, the African -American, uh, and by the African Americans. Um, and then there's witnesses. So I just wanted to make sure that we read that in because this is a very important um, year for our Atlantic High, being that it's 50 years. And now we are moving on to our regular agenda. And sorry for the delay. It ta it's taken a long time to get to this point. So thank you all for holding out. And we are at the first, which is going to be the, the three items that I pulled from the agenda, which was the 6D, 6E, and 6F, which is Delray Beach Historic Society funding, the expansion of, of our preservation cultural heritage funding agreement, and then also the Sandaway House funding agreement. And what I wanted to do with that is just to bring it up to my colleagues. Um, this year was a very different year. There was a lot of transition. We really didn't have the opportunity for these um, great uh, nonprofits in our city to present. I wanted to ask that we allow for, because this is a funding agreement that uh, goes for uh, five years, I'd like to ask us for us to be able to maybe um, allow for a, um, an, um, uh, an, a, an addendum or something to put on that allows for them to present their issues to us at next year and possibly consider anything different. Um, otherwise, they're locked in. Is that possible? 
time. Absolutely. Okay, so that's all I'm asking for because they never had the opportunity, and I'm going to be honest with you, this year was not a year that I think that we could have done anything more than what we were doing, which is to hold everything at the same level, being that we were in a deficit situation due to COVID and the lack of the revenues coming in. But next year may be different, and there may be issues that we can talk about at that point in time, and I just wanted to um, ask that we allow for the these these three to come in and at least talk about what their needs are and possibly help them. If not, that's fine too, but at least they would have that opportunity that they didn't have this year. We can add that to the agreement. So basically you're just saying that maybe during a budget workshop they'd be afforded the opportunity to present. Yep. And that would be in the, you know, obviously the budgeting season, sure. not short of the budgeting season. So that was my um, recommendation. So if we can do that, that'd be that'd great. Be great. And we can pass each one. Did Mr. Moore, did you want to say anything or no? You're good. No, I appreciate the direction to that effect because I've actually mm -hmm. spoken and met with leadership of the various organizations who expressed the similar interests. And my advice was fairly consistent with the idea you just offered here this evening. So with that, and, and given the timing of, of direction in that regard, I'll be more than happy to work with all involved. Fantastic. Okay, so let's go each one, um, which is, starts with the uh, 60. May I, may I say oh, something? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. I think that's very important because with the CRA sometimes lessening uh, funding for these organizations, it's very important that the city be given the opportunity to revisit them. So I appreciate your. And, and, and let me also say this to my colleagues, just so you understand. I mean, there are organizations that basically are more entertainment um, oriented and are, are bringing in a lot. Then there are those that are educational. And those educational or, um, organizations or partners have less opportunity to be able to really bring in um, additional funds. So they, they're the ones that I'm really kind of focused on right now. So anyway, let's so go Mayor, ahead. And do, you want these, uh, do you want that provision in their agreements or you just want that to be expressly understood? Um, I don't know what would be better. I mean, I it's don't know if you want to change the agreement, but I, I and it's if not they've a already big deal signed. to change it, and it's it's always better to have something memorialized so everybody's aware of it. So it's it's not a big change. And as you know, these are always subject to appropriations. Mm -hmm. So in the event that you did have additional appropriations or you had less, the agreement will always be reflective so. of that. But I'll ma I'll make sure that that gets added, and then we'll um, submit them submit them to you for signature. Thank you so much. Can we get a motion for um, 60? As amended. As amended. Motion to approve as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Now 6E. Motion to approve as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And now 6F. Motion to approve as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? And yes. And now we are on our regular agenda, item 7A. Reese and Duncan. On the start. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners, City Manager Moore, Elise Treisman, Purchasing Manager. And I will be co presenting this item with Duncan Tavares, Assistant City Manager. Good evening. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Tonight, uh, sorry, a little different here. We have, I have to walk and talk and chew at the same time. Um, tonight for your consideration is a motion to approve resolution number 123-21 toward an agreement with Miller 3 Consulting Inc. for disparity study consulting services pursuing to request for proposals number 2021-015 in the amount of two hundred and ninety-two thousand one hundred and excuse me, one hundred and twenty-five dollars. And it's been a while since we've talked in a public forum about disparity studies. So, if you allow us a few minutes, we'll walk you through kind of what this is and how we got here tonight. And also, I'd like to inform the commission that in the audience is uh, a great representation of Miller 3. So they are here to answer any detailed questions that maybe staff uh, are not able to. So if I can take you back to uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget process, the commission approved an appropriation to conduct a disparity study to review the city's purchasing practice. The commission appropriated funding for this effort 
with a condition or provide, uh, provision that 20% of the final cost to be a contribution from the community redevelopment agency. So what is the goal of a disparity study? The goal is to determine if a significant statistical disparity exists between the percentages of ready and available women and minority contractors in the city's market and the percentages of contract dollars awarded to such firms by the city. The results of the study can be used to guide the city in the creation of policies or programs to address any disparities found. Should the, sorry, should this recommendation for contract award be approved, the services to be provided shall include the study findings as well as remedies for the city's consideration to address the findings. Programs and policies may include both race and gender neutral policies and programs as well as narrowly tailored race and gender preference programs. And now it's me. Got it. Thank you. So I'm going to speak to you about the procurement process. Um, so on February 5th, 2021, the city, Adver Duncan, do you think that you could, you got it? Perfect, thank you. The city advertised a full and open request for proposal number 2021-015 for disparity study consulting services. This RFP was advertised on the city's website utilizing its electronic plat procurement platform, BidSync. This system promotes transparency and enables the city to cast a wide net by inviting interested, interested parties of bid opportunities. The city received three responses to the RFP, and in accordance with city policy, a selection committee was established to review the proposal, to review and score the responsive proposals based upon the solicitation evaluation criteria as summarized on the next slide. Committee members were the police chief, Neighborhood and Community Services Director, Assistant City Attorney, Public Works Director, Assistant City Manager, and a non-voting technical advisor from the Palm Beach County Office of Equal Business Opportunity. The committee reviewed and evaluated the two responsive proposals submitted by MGT of America Consulting and Miller 3 Consulting, Inc. On April 9, 2021, the selection committee held interviews with these two firms. The final scores are listed below, along with the initial price proposal figures. The selection committee recommended award of the contract to Miller 3 Consulting, Inc. as the highest ranked firm for the negotiated amount of $292,125. The purchasing department reviewed the prices offered in comparison to other jurisdictions' costs for similar services, and pricing is deemed fair and reasonable. The agreement term will be from the date of full exec execution through the completion of the work, which is estimated to be approximately one year. Um, in coordination with the city attorney's office, the following due diligence tasks were performed to review the responsibility of the recommended vendor. Reference checks were performed and deemed satisfactory, and legal research was performed to ensure that no pending litigation with the firm. Um, in uh, responsibility determination, the experience demonstrated is shown on this slide. Uh, Miller 3 Consulting has performed over 135 studies, including 28 in Florida, um, uh, Florida municipality studies, City of Tampa, City of St. Pete, City of Jacksonville, and goes on, South Florida studies, other Florida studies. Um, we. Also, I put them in uh, a table for you, uh, breaking it down to municipal uh, Florida experience, other entities in South Florida, other entities um, in Florida, and other national entities. And that's it for me. And Duncan, I'm going to turn it back over to you. So I know this is a, a long list, but I think it's important to understand the amount of uh, effort that goes into one of these studies. And these are the services that are going to be rendered by the vendor, but it's not limited to these 14 uh, important uh, parts of the study that was provided in your agenda packet. So obviously, uh, we'll start with legal analysis. That is uh, of primary concern. Uh, procurement, uh, looking at the culture and systems analysis for uh, minority and uh, women business enterprises. Data collection, this is data-driven 
in many respects. So you'll see that throughout uh, everything that will come before you. Uh, relevant market analysis, and again, that looks at you know what is in our area, but also what we could pull from, if you will. Um, utilization analysis is then conducted, uh, and I missed one, sorry, availability analysis. So again, this is a very technical approach to a very sensitive subject. Uh, around this point, there would be a public informational session, and public hearing is anticipated. Um, so this is a way to, again, inform everyone of where we are to date and to get feedback from the public if there's anything uh, potentially that, that needs to be addressed. So uh, continuing after that is a disparity analysis and statistical significance, capacity analysis, anecdotal and survey analysis, private sector analysis, analysis of race, gender neutral initiatives, and then you'll get a, the staff will get a final draft report uh, that includes some sample ordinances and policies for, dis for consideration. Um, with staff input after review of that, and obviously staff, I'm talking about legal as well, uh, there'll be a final report produced and presented to the commission for acceptance, questions, uh, evaluation. Um, something that is important when you do one of these disparity studies is that you want to make sure that the the company that you're working with is also available to be uh, an expert witness if there should be a challenge. And Miller 3 Consulting is, is uh, committed to doing that at any point, that if we institute any of the changes and there is some legal challenge, they are available to come and speak on behalf of their work product. Um, per the firm, uh, their uh, consulting studies have, have um, None of their consultant studies have ever been overturned, and none of them have been challenged since 1997. Again, I, I would defer to the vendor for any technical questions that you may have about the disparity study. Uh, staff is available to talk about process that got us here, but really um, the reason we're here is that we don't have the technical expertise internally, and uh, we will rely on the consultant. Thank you, and to the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, of course, am going to want to have the, um, the company come forward and not necessarily give us too much information. Come ahead. But I just have a couple of questions. Sure. First of all, welcome. And uh, where is your headquarters? So uh, first, let me acknowledge um, Mayor Petrolio, Vice Mayor Johnson, and City Manager Moore. Uh, we are an Atlanta based, based in Atlanta, Georgia, and so I bring you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. I will say to you that your staff has already did a very good summary of what the disparity study entails and some of the uh, analysis that we will go through as a part of this process. And so, but to your short answer to your question is Atlanta, Georgia. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Just one more. Um, we in the city of Delray, no matter how hard I believe we try, to present to the public the fact that you're having a, um, how did I say it, they moved it, uh, declare, um, informational sessions and public hearings. I don't care what you try to do, um, they're gonna say they didn't know. So I don't know how you're gonna address that problem, just be aware. Um, I don't know if we have to have a town crier running up and down the streets on a horseback saying there's going to be a meeting, there's going to be a meeting. Um, computers don't always work um, as far as our, our, our networks, our websites, our, even Facebook. They, don't, they claim they don't know. So just be aware and do everything you can. Come here, announce it. Uh, CRA meetings, announce it. Um, HOAs, whatever, just do your best. So, so inside of our study, there's a communications plan. Did you? There, inside of our study is a communication plan that really speaks to this issue that you're reference, referencing now. Uh, what we do typically is have a frequently asked questions sort of built out and placed on your website. We also have our local subcontractors here. Uh, Mr. Rob Long with D&D Strategies and Ms. Anne-Marie Sorrell, they are local, so they can help us navigate 
uh, the local landscape that's here in Delray Breach. And so we are familiar with traversing very challenging areas. Uh, and so this, I don't think, would be any exception to that. So you're physically going physically to have personnel here. That would be great to come back and tell us if you can't do it today, where you're going to be located. So I will allow uh, Ms. Ann Marie to sort of st stand up if she would like and maybe announce a little bit more her. about herself. Ann Marie will be assisting in the public hearings and focus group, as well as some of the race neutral analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Ann Marie Sorrell. I am no stranger to the city of Delray Beach. Uh, my company, the Mosaic Group, has been in Palm Beach County for over 16 years, and we've done work in Delray Beach for quite a few of those years. Um, I'll be working alongside my colleague, Ron Lob, to Ron. Rob Long <laughs> to um, do the different outreach efforts as well as the focus groups and public meetings and hearings. So we will be putting forth every effort, um, including boots on the ground, as well as um, social media, email, and so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No, I have nothing else. Thank you. Mr. Boston? No, I'm just, uh, I'm ready to approve because this has been years, literally many years in, in the making. So it's the only comments I have. Sure. May I ask just one question? I was just reading some of the um, work about some of the work you did in Philadelphia, and there's indications that there was uh, there were some issues with data collection uh, in Philadelphia, according to something I read in online. And I thought could have been related to COVID and the timing, because I think that was the 2020 report. And I'm sure that if you're trying to get information prior to that, data collection could have been problematic. But it did also note that. Um, the city disagreed with some of your findings. And so I guess, could you talk to me about what does that look like? You present your findings and then in that case, for example, why did the city disagree with your findings? So for disparity studies, you have to have a statistically sound uh, study. Right. And as a result of our analysis, we came up with an availability measure that was slightly below what the city had publicized and wanted to. So they effectively create a stretch goal. Okay. Uh, and so our work has to be legally defensible. Right. And so because of that, we can't issue a stretch goal if the findings does not support that. And so there was a I think it was about a three percentage difference. So it wasn't a huge not delta there, but uh, they had took a different position. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, you have uh, the um, Palm Beach County uh, School Board as one of your um, clients doing a disparity study? Yes, they are past clients. Okay, so are they up and running with their disparity study? Their program is up and running. Okay, um, I just had, and, and this is just in passing, that there were issues with that study and that they're not doing it. And I'm not sure why that is. Are you aware? No, I'm unaware. We are currently completing our work for the Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Uh, actually, tomorrow they will be adopting some of the board policy recommendations that we made as a result of completing the study. Uh, typically, in completing studies, there are, there's a faction mm -hmm. that are uh, in agreement of the outcomes, and then there can be competing fractions. Uh, I think the point here that I'd like to make is, for those who are in support and recognizing the the reach as a result of completing these studies and the impact it has on typically underserved communities outweigh at times some of the uh, non-supporting factions, I would say. Okay. Um, from, my, from what I've been able to, you know, find out about, uh, you know, the, the disparity study is, is, is the most important part of it is, is the data being gathered and being able to make sure that you don't get to a point where um, you're utilizing it and then you're being challenged. That's probably one of the most important things. Um, I am concerned about that, truthfully. Um, I, I think that there are, and this is, you know, this, I understand this, this uh, disparity study has been long in the waiting and it's something that I support 100%, in fact, brought forward. But I have issues with um, whether or not we're going to end up with a $300,000 um, investment on the back side of this with a, a study that actually will be act, will will be able to meet with any kind of a legal challenge. I have had some opportunities to speak with um, uh, some uh, experts in the in the area. Um, you know, just 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 
offhand, and this was, a, a, I would say, a long time ago before we even actually went out for, for this, where there are companies that are, are actually uh, consultants that actually do, put together the RFP that would have the disparity study in, in a, a way that makes sure that we will get that data and information that will be able to meet a legal challenge. Because once again, you know, the worst thing that can happen in worse than not doing the study is doing the study, spending the taxpayer dollars and not ending up at the end with something that is able to be to meet and, um, you know, um, you know, meet a challenge because there's probably going to be some. That's just the reality of the situation. We're changing the way we're going to be doing business. And there are going to be people who are not going to be happy with that change. And so my biggest concern is that. And I personally would rather see Mr. Moore take this and make sure that before we make any decision of a $300,000 deal, I would rather have him go through this and look to see whether or not this is really where we want to be personally. Um, I feel more comfortable that way because he was not part of this process. I trust him. And I think that we should hand it over to Mr. Moore to do. That's my feeling. I'm not going to support this moving forward today. I'd rather have you involved in, in anything that we're doing on this level so that we make sure that we are with the right um, you know, companies that is going to give us the right data so that at the very end there's no question that we will have a tool that we can actually use. And if it takes a little bit more time, I'm okay with that. So that's where I stand. I'm sorry? Can, I can't make a motion <laughs> unless have, I pass the, the gavel. Can we have staff walk us through the process of how we got to where we are today? And then I think we did. More, I'd like, um, I'm sorry? I think we did, didn't we? Didn't you just walk us through the yes, absolutely. And and Mr. Moore, do you have any concerns in regards to that process? <clears throat> so I actually did spend time with staff to evaluate the process because of course some of the questions came up relative to the statistical analysis associated with it and the associated financial investment that would be made by the city of Delray Beach in this regard. A particular concern also had to do with the fact that this had been a, an evolved process with respect to the amount of time and questions, reviews associated with this particular activity, disparity studies, and so forth. And of course, much of the work was accomplished prior to my arrival. So coming on board nearly three months ago, I had a lot of questions about a number of projects, programs, initiatives, financial transactions across the board. And this was actually presented to me back in late August, early September, literally within being a few weeks on board. Mm -hmm. And I did have a few questions with respect to the associated financial investment, with respect to what is to be achieved to support a, a legal document, a legal outcome, a defensible outcome. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, that's one of the reasons why we are before the city commission tonight as opposed to earlier so that there can be an opportunity made available by staff, agents who were involved in this work prior to my arrival. So with that, the, the consideration has been made available this evening for city commission review. However, the presentation having just been provided by staff is actually more involved than what was initially anticipated to be presented a couple meetings ago because of the various questions and concerns I did bring up. So, of course, you have representatives from the consulting firm in position this evening to do what they possibly can to clarify and respond to whatever questions and concerns that might exist. And I think some of that have been entertained already. Yet at the same time, because much of the work had been initiated prior to my arrival, I'm not as thoroughly familiar with the details other than the direction I provided since I've been on board in terms of a thorough presentation which was offered fairly well, I think, this evening. Yet at the same time, I was not involved in it from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Um, do, you do you have any concerns this evening? Generally speaking, <coughs> without having been involved in this particular effort from the very beginning to the end, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a question relative to full ownership. I do not have full ownership per se, yet at the same time, I'm comfortable making it work in either regard. So 
If the direction I'm part of the commission is to proceed, I will have a bit of a learning curve, of course. If direction is to consider other opportunities or a follow-up evaluation in that regard, the benefit of that approach is that I would have the ability to be involved in terms of offering leadership and guidance from step one to the final step of a recommendation. So if, if there is a preference for you, I mean, obviously you step into this position and there's many things <clears throat> That's correct. already in motion. We can't, That's correct. You can't restart them all so that you can be part, part of them from the beginning. Sometimes, sometimes I can, sometimes right? I cannot. Sometimes you can. Correct. Um, what would be your preference here? I'm open for business. I'm flexible. I, I think. Just a, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm just no, I was going to say, though. Then, no, no, no. I just okay. wanted to assist him one second, though. But it, this has really big ramifications. Some of the other stuff, like the TNVR program, it's so. Go ahead and continue. Um, uh, and why wasn't this concern brought up prior to, I mean, this is on the schedule. This is on the agenda, not as a discussion item. This is a, on, on our agenda as a decision. Um, to adopt staff's recommendation. Why wasn't any of these concerns brought up prior to tonight? Actually, they were. In fact, there was an opportunity or a suggestion made to the Office of the City Manager that we proceed with this consideration back in September. Because again, the presentation you just experienced this evening was initially not as expansive as it is tonight. Mm -hmm. So there were a number of open questions and concerns relative to the transaction process, relative to the scope and the work associated with the disparity study as it relates to Delray Beach. I did have a couple questions relative to some of the other experiences. I think one of the questions having to do with Philadelphia and that particular exercise. And so my direction, quite frankly, based on my initial review of this particular consideration in late August, beginning of September, was to take more time so that we can provide a more thorough presentation, which was accomplished this evening by staff. Right. I think staff provided a, a more expansive presentation in terms of the background and experiences of this particular organization to help move forward Miller 3 Consulting. And my other concern initially, again, prior to this particular consideration being made available tonight, October 19th, 2021, was any other experiences in Palm Beach County. So I learned a little bit about their experiences with the Palm Beach County School District. I learned a little bit about the fact that work is currently underway with Miami-Dade County School District. What are the outcomes and ramifications to be achieved as a result of that particular experience? And quite frankly, when we first began speaking about this particular consideration back in September, early September, late August, I still had questions and, and a lack of knowledge. So I'm more knowledgeable now than I was before. In other words, Commissioner Boylston, there was an initial recommendation on staff to have this matter come before you a month prior. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's be as thorough as we possibly can in terms of making a presentation in that regard. And again, I do my best to be thorough and extremely analytical. I'm a very capable numbers person. And, and initially, I did have some concerns. But again, many of those questions have been resolved, resulting in the opportunity for the mayor and commission to offer direction accordingly. Great. Thank you. I, anything else? Yes, I, I would like to chime in now. I appreciate everyone's hard work and the desire to get this study underway. I, however, I think it's a disadvantage that we're placing our city manager in to come in. Once again, we've thrown a lot at you. My apologies for any part I might have played in that. But um, I'd like to give you more time if you ask for it. But if you're telling me you don't want it, uh, we don't want to have hindsight and say, say later, well, if I'd had more time. So I'm offering it to you. I don't know how long it's going to be um, that you want to have before you feel comfortable with everything. It's, it's not like we're um, trying to delay anything. It's just I want our city manager to be successful in navigating this. And since you did not have a lot of time and you've come on board as quickly as you could, I'd be very comfortable with your saying, well, if I could have another dash, dash, dash. I think that um, from my perspective and just hearing what Mr. Moore had spoken about and I was part of um, talking with you earlier and having my own concerns about some of the issues um, with respect to 
um, uh, this disparity study is is um, letting you see it from start to finish. That that would be comfortable for me because you know when you own something, you know you're going to make sure that you get it from start to finish. And I don't think that we, we're giving you that opportunity. You're being, you know, asked to work with what has already started working through. So to me, I'd rather see you get it um, from the start to finish. And we just we we don't ag approve this and we move forward and allow you to to um, begin the process so that you can make sure that what's in that. Uh, disparity study RFP is what you know is going to be able to be successful at the tail end of this. This is a huge investment. I do not want to get to the end of the investment and have to answer to anybody that we did not do what we needed to do to make sure that it was a successful um, uh, disparity study that will actually hold up in court. That's my biggest concern, and um, I'm, I'm sticking with it. I just don't, I don't have that surety. So. There, that's where I am with it. How long did this RFP process take from the very beginning, from when commission uh, gave direction to go out till today? I'm looking, well, Mr. Moore yeah. wasn't here, that's for sure. That's right, I was not. Mr. Tavares, if you can respond, please, and I do have a follow-up thought. So, um, since the initial discussion for the appropriation, I, I believe there was discussion at the commission prior to that. I know I've since then heard discussion at the CRA, but um, the process was, I think since April was, was when uh, the committee met. So it was out in the field the recommended amount of time. Um, we had some challenges with COVID and some changes in, in the city manager's office to um, effectively just get, you know, to review and get on, on an agenda. But since then we've worked on this uh, so, so we talked to Mr. Moore and he expressed his concerns. We went back and reviewed everything that we had gone through. Um, purchasing had yeah, also, on February 5th. so February 5th was when it was advertised we met. 2021, the in 2021. Yes. Cor correct. correct. And uh, we did some due diligence of more research to make sure that this was still the company that it said it was, you know, when they responded and um, felt comfortable presenting it tonight as, as we did, but. Uh. Thank you. And how long would a disparity study take if we were to start a new one, a RFP? A new solicitation? Yeah. I mean, I would guess at least six months. Yeah. At least. And, and just so we're clear, so this was a solicitation, so you obviously have the right to reject um, the recommendation of a award. However, I believe that there's, there's other proposers that you could either um, direct staff to negotiate with the number two, or you can just reject all the bids and proposals and direct staff to start fresh. So I just wanted to give you all the options. And if I may, ladies and gentlemen, if the inclination is to proceed in a different direction other than what was discussed this evening, given my arrival here in Derry Beach for just shy of three months, yeah. my yeah. professional inclination would be to engage a new selection process to consider all opportunities including Miller 3 or any other company that may have previously submitted, and to truly and thoroughly evaluate. Quite frankly, given previous experiences with this type of background and activity, I would love to ascertain any, any specific experiences locally here in South Florida, here in Palm Beach County, any opportunities to make a connection in that regard so that we can do what we can to connect the dots from a data analytical standpoint and therefore go from there. So if that is the direction this evening, part of tomorrow's executive leadership team meeting discussion will be to outline a course of direction as to how we would get to that place. And we will work as expeditiously as we possibly can, yet be as responsible as possible so as to offer a good clean recommendation such that all concerns are addressed. But my principal concern that I'm hearing here at the dais is, is new city manager speaking in second person will have an opportunity to shepherd the recommendation process and to truly be comfortable to defend what happened. Much of the work occurred between February 2021 and the beginning of August 2021. I was not in position during those six months period of time. First day of service, arrived to Delray Beach at the end of July. First day, Monday, August 2nd, 2021. So if there is an interest in developing a comfort level in that regard, I will be more than happy and welcome the opportunity to offer leadership and guidance accordingly. Thank you. 
Entertain a motion. If there were motion to approve resolution number 12321 to award an agreement with Miller 3 Consulting for disparity <coughs> study consulting services pursuant to RFP number 2021-015. A second. I'm not certain. Fails with a second. Do we have another motion? Motion to deny. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mayor, I think just for purposes of the record, I think a motion should be made um, directing staff as to what the commission's wishes are. Whether okay, you. Okay, so um, in other words, to dis. Just continue reject the, the proposals entire RFP or or direct start staff a to new one she with the number two make a make a motion to that a motion to discontinue this RFP process and start anew with the under the direction of our new city manager second call the roll mr. Boston yes miss Johnson yes mayor Petrolia yes miss Cassell yes thank you guys thank, thank you. you we hope to see you Okay, moving on to 7B, which is the ratification of emergency regulations. I don't think that there's any explanation needed. I mean, I can do Motion one. to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. And moving on to 7C, Pineapple Grove Arts District donation of a dog. <laughs> yes. Uh, controversial dog. Yeah. So, uh, good evening again, Duncan Tavares, Assistant City Manager, as your liaison to the Public Art Advisory Board. To, uh, back in June, the uh, Pineapple Grove Main Street approached the board about accepting a donation of a dog sculpture. <laughs> uh, this was sort of the second approach to the board. Uh, there was a lot of discussion the first time around that it came that it may have not been appropriate for a certain spot but the board was convinced the second time around that they uh, would like to accept the donation. There's the dog. Um, with the recommendation that it goes at 30, uh, sorry, 325 Northwest 2nd Avenue. And this is the location that was earmarked. Um, I do want to bring to attention a number of places within Pineapple Grove have been uh, looked at as possible art installations that does, you know they that these locations do not inf uh, interfere with vehicular vehicular or pedestrian traffic. So this is the one, and it's going to be right around there. And as um, designed uh, in the ordinance that can that oversees the public art advisory board they make a recommendation to the commission so while it was a four zero unanimous recommendation on their board it is at the commission purview whether to accept the recommendation and thus the donation if in doing so staff will will ensure that uh, the donation is received and through all the proper legal protocols May I ask a question? question. Sure. This sure. unknown <laughs> artist, did someone abandon the dog? How did we acquire the dog? How did... Does... The poor dog. Um, no, so, uh, again, I, I apologize. I haven't been involved Sorry. that much in the process, uh, being relatively new, but I've heard many stories of uh, this dog needing to be adopted. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm feeling. And uh, this temporary location <laughs> was only until it found uh, a more permanent home. So it's, I, I believe this poor sculpture has been in limbo for, uh, yeah, I was looking for Max, but I think he left uh, at least a couple of years. Um, maybe, maybe that's a stretch, but COVID was in, in there too, so that complicated the time frame. But uh, I have a question. If you could pass forward to the locations that you suggested. Do we ask the businesses that we're placing the dog or any other sculpture in front of if they'd like to have it? So that, that is usually our process, uh, and I believe this was conducted with this business here. Um, it is public right away, but I do understand the sensitivity of having something you know in front of your business, right? That wasn't there when you uh, start, but... Uh, if it were a dog place I might not mind but I don't know this is a law firm and 
and they were agreeable. Uh, so I am told, yes. Because this is, this is a project you that I You were told by staff? Or? Correct, correct, yes. Who had this prior to me. Are we talking about right in the middle? So we would place it sort of where Bassett wouldn't interfere. So more than likely it's going to be closer to the planting okay, section. Okay, so like where the garbage can is kind of in that vicinity but towards the plantings? Right, more okay, towards so the on street. That linear Correct. spot. So you're leaving that open place Correct. open. yes. Yeah. So we, uh, we work with Public Works before the installation, like I believe you may remember the Shy Dancer that, that you uh, approved. That, you know, the location is one thing, but when you get in the field and start moving it around, so, uh, but we're, that's where we're looking at uh, installing it, but. It, Would you go back to the picture of the abandoned dog? I think that's what you should, we should call it, the abandoned yes. dog, the lost dog. Yes, but dog. it actually, I think. What, what, what are the materials? Um, I love it from the. So uh, it's a mixture of metal and I believe like um, some sort of uh, prefabricated uh, support in the column. It's not concrete. Um, it will be anchored in place, so it will ensure that it. We'll so so we're going to break up the bricks wherever? So what, what happens is the Public Works Department builds uh, a little bit of a platform, uh, a cement platform that they attach the sculpture to, and then they attach the, pla uh, the platform right into the sidewalk for stability and, of course, for security as well. And this was approved uh, uh, fully by the... Um, Correct. Um, so, Arts District Board. so at, at the risk of jumping in, you, you can uh, obviously authorize it as is, as presented, or you can give uh, another option that I could take back to the donor, basically. Uh, the donor is the uh, Pineapple Grove Main Street, but you know, if you felt there was a more appropriate place for the sculpture, we could return to them to ask if that's possible if the donation could include placing the abandoned dog in a different location in the city. I personally, I mean, I, I think that it's a difference than, you know, what we have there right now. So it kind of adds a little bit of interest versus, you know, the Shy Dancer. There's, a, there's several of that same artists along that street. So um, to me, I, I have no opposition. And especially if the board you know, was uh, in favor of it. I, you know, I think that they would know better than I would. I think it's kind of interesting, and I think it'll be a conversation piece. This was a multiple, uh, multi-meeting uh, discussion mm -hmm. by the board. So. Was that because they were vacillating? They were unsure? Could you be more specific on that? Because I'm waffling on this. I'm not. So sure. I think it's a challenge when you have open space right. and you know you're charged with filling it and you don't mm -hmm. have much of a budget. So. You know, what do you put in that space? Is it the appropriate space? Um, I believe the first place they looked at was in front of a gallery. So there was a lot of debate, like, is this something that should be in front of a gallery or is it more a conversation piece elsewhere in the, look, in the general vicinity that has nothing, you know, so. Well, I'll say that this piece feels very much Pineapple Grove Arts District. Yeah, it does. Sure. Uh, like original Pineapple Grove Arts District. I know art's moving more to a more contemporary, you know, street art type look. Um, but this feels like original Pineapple Grove. It does. Uh, it reminds me of the art. pineapples that were painted kind it of. It actually almost, does. The colors and the, the gateway kind of the, to Pineapple the Grove fun, near Atlantic. It's kind of got the that fun vibe. nature of it. I yeah. don't disagree. So yeah. I'm, I, I support it. Could we just... I'll support it, but can we just confirm that the uh, law firm is comfortable with that location? And then I, I... But they weren't the only ones. What about the other two that he showed? I think he selected the... Did you think that the law firm was... What's the law firm? Right. And I believe there's an empty uh, bay uh, on one is side of ray? it. Yeah. Uh, an empty yeah. uh, uh, storefront, I, I think maybe to the left or the right. I okay. can't remember. Um, I did go in and look at the space, but I don't a month ago, but. Uh, right. so, motion so motion to approve 7C. Place. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, ahead, just a couple uh, second, more questions. Second for, second for discussion. I'm sorry, okay. Second. Okay, for discussion. Okay. This is the appointed place that the staff picked or the board 
the, the board decided that it was. So the other two that you showed us were just. So this was, uh, well, sorry. How do I get back to the full? Meaning not to. Good thing IT's here. So I only provided this as a reference. Uh, you know, when we give you a street address that may be so narrowed in, you may not know the exact building. So this is to give you a reference of the building. And then if you continue, what would be uh, north? Is the location? It's across from that. I don't It's actually ac across from the Ray Hotel. Right, right across. It's from across from the Ray. Okay. Who has a, a rabbit? I believe. Right. In there. Rabbit. Pink rabbit. Yeah. Right. yeah. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. So we have a, a motion and a second. Um, is that the end of discussion? Call the roll. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Duncan. And moving on to 8A, ordinance number 17-21. And this is a public hearing. I'm ready. Go right Long ahead. Brace yourself. Long read. Here we go. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.3, District Regulations, General Provisions, Section 4.3.3, Special Requirements for Specific Uses, Subsection W, Veterinary Clinics, to rename the subsection and to provide specific regulations for domestic animal service facilities, including parking requirements, overnight boarding, and outside use areas, amending Article 4.4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.9, General Commercial GC District, subsection B, Principal Uses and Structures Permitted, to remove pet grooming from the list of permitted services and facilities, and amending subsection D, Conditional Uses and Structures Allowed, to add pet services and pet hotels as a conditional use, Amending Section 4.4.11, Neighborhood Commercial NC District, Subsection D, Conditional Uses and Structures Allowed, to add pet services as a conditional use. Amending Section 4.4.13, Central Business CBD District, Subsection C, Allowable Uses. Table 4.4.13A, Allowable Uses and Structures in the CBD Subdistricts, to add pet services as a conditional use to all subdistricts and pet hotels as a conditional use to the railroad corridor subdistrict. Amending section 4.4.16, professional and office POD district, subsection D, conditional uses and structures allowed. To reference section 4.3.3W, amending section 4.4.18, planned commerce center, PCC district, subsection B, allowed uses to add pet services without outside use areas. Amending section 4.4.19, mixed industrial and commercial MIC district. Subsection D, conditional uses and structures allowed to update terminology and to add pet services with outside use areas. Amending section 4.4.20, industrial I district, subsection D, conditional uses and structures permitted to update terminology and add pet services with outside use areas. Amending section 4.4.24, old school square historic arts district, OSHAD, subsection D, Conditional uses and structures allowed to add pet services and veterinary clinics and amending subsection at H, special district regulations to provide additional limitations on pet services and veterinary clinics. Amending section 4.4.26, light industrial LI district, subsection D, conditional uses and structures allowed to add pet services with outside use areas, pet hotels and animal shelters. Amending section 4.4.29, mixed residential office and commercial MROC district, subsection E, conditional uses and structures allowed to add pet services. Amending appendix A, definitions to adopt definitions for animal shelter, domestic animals, domestic animal services, pet hotel and pet services, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. Oh, I feel like. Job. Yeah. <laughs> Mayor, this is a public hearing. This is second reading. And just a reminder, um, and this is more for the benefit of people in the public, um, this ordinance is not going to approve or deny any services that may be operating currently, now, or in the future. What this is going to do is it's going to give an avenue for, for entities that are operating in this fashion, maybe facing code violations, to actually submit an application that if this is approved, it will ultimately come back to the commission as a conditional use. So with that being said, any comments specific to any organizations, businesses that are currently operating, they're not relevant to this consideration. And we would ask that they not be made because you will probably be stopped. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go right ahead. Okay. Hey, good evening. And the Agenotis Development Services Director. Um, 
I do want to give a fairly thorough presentation. There have been a lot of changes between planning board and first reading and the final version before you. And there was a little bit of confusion with the backup having the planning board staff report. I did receive more than one inquiry kind of asking me to be sure they understood what was being adopted. So um, what I want to go over now is part of the issue is that we have a code that really doesn't address many of these uses. We have veterinary clinics clearly defined and accommodated in our codes. Kennels not defined, but accommodated in a couple of the industrial districts. And then pet grooming, also not defined, shows up in a couple of districts. And so, you know, domestic animal uses have evolved and changed um, over time, and our code really didn't respond to what we see in the market now and what we were being faced with um, being asked to um, accommodate. So on April 6, 2021, the City Commission directed staff to update the LDRs um, to, you know, address addi additional or domestic animal services. The intent of the ordinance is to support and encourage high quality domestic animal services, but also to mitigate any impact they might have on surrounding neighborhoods, particularly residential uses. Um, and so, again, to, reiter to reiterate what City Attorney Jellin just said, this is not about approving a specific business. This is about approving a collective set of rules for how these types of uses are going to work in our city. Um, so, the existing definition for veterinary clinic is not changed. This ordinance does add five new definitions, so we all know what we're talking about when we're dealing with these uses. Um, there, um, a couple of them were slightly tweaked between first and second reading, so I'll go over that. Animal shelter was unchanged. Um, domestic animals, do domesticated companion animals, such as dog, cats, birds, or other tamed animals is the definition. Your tiger does not count, but I guess maybe your ferret could. Um, domestic animal services are um, places of business, either for profit or not for profit, that provide services for the care and well being of domestic animals, including veterinary clinics, pet service establishments, pet hotels, and animal shelters. So that's the collective group of all the different services for domestic services that the city is going to accommodate. And then there are specific definitions from there. Um, obviously animal shelter and then a pet hotel is a place of business that provides both daily and overnight boarding accommodations overnight being a key distinction of that definition pet services are um, a place of business that provides for temporary care and services like grooming bathing training and daytime boarding so these are things where there isn't an overnight um, function but you know the animals may be in or out um, depending on the extent of the services during the day. At first reading, I'm going to say this very clearly, the um, City Commission directed staff to change all of the uses that we had brought forward because we had kind of categorized them, well, pet grooming's okay, and if it has an outside use, then it needs a conditional use, but if it doesn't, then it's permitted. And the discussion basically was that these uses tend to co-locate. Your groomer turns into your doggy daycare. Your vet has overnight boarding sometimes. And so in an effort to really be sure that we could um, properly um, evaluate the businesses coming forward, all of the uses are moving to conditional. So that means pet grooming, which was permitted in GC in the Central Business District in OSHAD, is now conditional. So it's getting a little bit longer process for approval um, and then other uses that were previously only allowed in industrial districts like the kennel which doesn't really respond to overnight boarding or animal shelters as we know them now um, are this is kind of how it shakes out so animal shelters you know which tend to be um, more um, you know the animals are there for longer periods of time unfortunately those are still limited to the industrial districts. A pet hotel is more of an overnight boarding with shorter stays, that type of thing. Those would be accommodated in GC, PC, in the railroad corridor subdistrict of the central business district, um, and then MIC, the industrial districts as well. Veterinary clinics were allowed as conditional uses in the um, the zoning districts that you see now. There's not been a significant change. The previous version contemplated and discussed whether they should just be permitted because 
They are highly regulated professional businesses, but they are in the final draft remaining conditional as well. The other thing I want to point out is the PC district was not in the very, very long caption that Attorney Jellin read, but because it adopts the same uses that GC has when GC changes, PC has. So just on the record, it's a use that's changing. PC is also changing, even though it wasn't in the caption. And then pet services, which are more the daily um, types of um, um, things that might happen with your animals, um, have a more broader have a more broad application um, throughout the city. Now, the industrial districts have certain caveats where pet grooming, for example, is allowed, but only if it is more intense and has an outside use area. Our industrial districts accommodate uses that we can't put in other places. So we really don't want to open them up to too much other service industries that can be easily accommodated in other zoning districts. However, training is part of pet services. And if you've ever been to obedience school or an agility course or some of the more intense training things, they really do happen in those types of areas because they're pretty significant outdoor areas associated with them. Okay. So I didn't drink any water because of our water situation, so I'll keep going. Um, okay, so the proposed changes. Again, all domestic um, animal uses are, are restricted to this. The hours of operation, unless otherwise approved through the conditional use process, are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Most of the veterinary clinics that you've seen come through this process will stipulate that they might be open longer if they are providing emergency care to a specific animal, but they're not necessarily, um, you know, the 24-hour hospitals that we have. Um, so at any rate, that's the hours operation. They can be adjusted through conditional use, but it would be a consideration if they go outside of this. There are enclosure and installation requirements. The parking requirements have been right size to these uses. Um, we did a lot of research with what our neighbors um, do and accommodate. Um, so there's a slight um, reduction in some of the services, but I mean, ultimately, a veterinary clinic that is seeing a certain number of patients within an hour doesn't have the same demand um, for um, some of the other things where it's a it's not quite as much turnover with the animals and the uses. So there's a there's an adjustment reflected in that. Outside use area is limited to drop off and pick up or an animal under direct control of a leash for a necessary walk. Okay, that's coming out of the gate. All other outdoor activity areas require conditional use approval. And I will remind you that in the current code, there are no outside activity uses that are allowed for these types of uses at all. Right. So this is an adjustment that loosens up and provides an avenue. Um, overnight boarding. The only establishments that could have animals overnight our veterinary clinics, the pet hotels, and animal shelters. Um, so you have to be very clear on which one of these businesses you're doing. Um, sufficiently insulated to minimize nose, noise and, or, and odor. There was um, a comment in the original, um, I guess the first version, the first reading version, as to how were we going to determine if something is sufficiently insulated. And so we borrowed a little bit of noise, a little bit of, of verbiage from our noise ordinance. And you know that all of these issues will also be you know, able to be studied under that update that we're doing. Um, but it basically, I'm going to try to find it. Hang on. Um, says that. If, the, if frequent, habitual, or long continued animal sounds are plainly audible from adjacent properties, the building is not considered sufficiently insulated. So this is something that if we can regularly observe as a chronic problem, then there needs to be action taken by the property owner to further mute the noise. So we're going to try that. The other thing is that if you have animals staying on site, our ordinance requires that an on-site attendant be there so that it's not putting the animals in and then leaving them unattended which is how the veterinary clinics tend to work when, because they're giving emergency care, so there's automatic oversight. Um, pet hotels and animal shelters cannot be located in mixed-use buildings that have residential uses in them. These are allowed in a wide, you know, those, those zoning districts accommodate a wide range of uses. If it's a standalone, that's great, but obviously we can't have it in the downstairs or next to people's, you know, residential units. 
And if you're keeping animals overnight, um, we would like to see an emergency plan, including a generator plan for what happens if there is no, um, I'm gonna keep going, <laughs> if there is no um, electricity. So outside use areas. Um, so these are allowed as part of a conditional use. And what that means is there's criteria that we're attaching to them that you should meet, which will help guide people to places where they could be accommodated. And the first is that they need to be 300 feet away from residentially zoned properties or another domestic animal outdoor use area. The 300 foot measure is very similar to what we use to control late night businesses and potential impacts of noise from them to adjacent neighborhoods. So it's keeping that same 300 foot metric. Um, outside use areas would be subject to the same minimum building setbacks and those might actually be increased as part of the conditional use approval or review or just, you know, adjusted. Um, other things, you know, humane things that we're not going to have outdoor cages or crates, um, that they has to be enclosed with either a wall or a privacy fence. And, um, you know, if you have an outdoor use area that is planted with grass and all that, it can be counted toward the open space requirement and it would be limited to the same outdoor activity hours. So what does this look like? Um, if it is in purple, it is allowed as a conditional use. The blue is really because the PCC zoning district relies on everything being kind of done through a master development plan. It's the uses are just organized very differently. So there's some uses that um, would be able to be accommodated as support functions, kind of similarly at like childcare is actually arranged there. So some of us have fur babies, some of us have children, some of us have both. So that's the only one that's a little weird and it's just because that, that zoning district just organizes uses differently. Um, other uses are, um, everything is allowed as a conditional use. This is OSHAD, which is sort of a unique district because it's our historic district and depending on um, the era, it can be predominantly residential or it can have a lot of office and so the Historic Preservation Board, um, there's a few more uses that are allowed now than were, uh, that are currently, uh, but they were very, um, careful about, um, for example, veterinary clinics I don't think are in there now and they would be allowed to be there, um, but they don't want to accommodate um, like an emergency vet and there's limitations on the outside areas that are attached to that zoning district in the ordinance. But everything else that's purple are most of our commercial districts so that allow some form of um, the uses. But remember, I was showing you they're different, right? Some districts say animal shelters and boarding. So let's go to those. There are six districts that would allow overnight boarding, either because it's an animal shelter or because it's a pet hotel. Um, not everyone, like GC, you know, doesn't necessarily allow an animal shelter. So that's what these look like. Again, it's a conditional use. It goes to planning board for a recommendation, and upon a positive recommendation comes before the city commission. There's a 500-foot notice before planning board, board to all of the neighbors so that you can participate. Um, and then if we put the metrics that we um, suggest for outdoor use areas, the types of businesses that can then meet the distance criteria, the location of those commercial districts that will be far enough away mm -hmm. um, to meet the um, standard separation um, are shown here. And, and they end up kind of at our major nodes and along some of our major corridors. So inside versus outside, all of it through a conditional use process to discuss impact and really broadening our uses to reflect sort of the modern day market. Um, ultimately, the findings before you is whether the text amendment is um, consistent with the comp plan, um, which really strives to make sure that we have complementary land uses on parcels, um, that we update to address market changes, things like that, and that we're using consistent terminology there's a few more in the backup. Um, this was reviewed by um, several advisory board, um, several advisory boards that all provided input. Um, Planning and Zoning Board actually discussed this twice. They ultimately recommended approval. However, it was the, um, in a way, less stringent version than what we see now. So this version is a little bit, everything's a conditional use, which is not what Planning Board saw. So that concludes. I guess my oversight and 
I'll be available for questions. Okay, I know we, it's a public hearing, but yeah. can you go back to slides, because the one with all the orange, um, mm -hmm. there. So tell me what the difference is between the hash orange, the regular orange, the, the purple. Okay, so the, I'm still not used to the new clicker, sorry. Um, so this is just, these. this means that it's, you know, kind of a residential zoning district. Okay. So you can see like SADs, which put their own uses in. You would do this on a case-by-case -case basis. That's why these are showing as white. They're not colored. Mm -hmm. If it is a commercial parcel that allows either an animal shelter or a pet hotel, it's colored in purple. Okay. The part that's colored, so here's the orange. Right. That's the buffer from like the, R, the, the RM or whatever that's across the street, which there's 300 feet. So that does take okay, out. Okay, so that for, dark orange is showing the buffer that right, is required. Right, you have to be beyond that. So you'll notice that that some of CBD disappears. The railroad corridor really can't accommodate an mm -hmm. outdoor pet hotel. A lot of GC is no longer in the mix because it's too close mm -hmm. to those residential neighborhoods. So what do I do if I want to roll the dice and ask to go closer than 300? Well, that's what waivers are for, and you can consider the waiver mm -hmm. with the conditional use. But this is intended to get people to locate in the right place out of the gate. Gotcha. So that they know I'm, I'm too close to the neighborhood. I, I really should go over here. Gotcha. Um, or I'm going to be able to open, but I'm not going to have an outside <clears throat> use area that's going to be easily accommodated in this particular location. Okay. And so what you're saying is, is in these or the, in, on this um, map, the only place that you could really have a pet hotel, let's say, would be those purple spots with conditional use. Well, with an outside play area. Or, so That's right, with an outside play area. courses and things like that, Correct. those things need to be here. Yep. If you want, you're not subject to the separation, you're subject okay. to the insulation and being a good neighbor. So this is only inside with a pet. Not the outside use That's area. Correct. Because okay, and so now let me ask you one other question. Go back uh, even more. There was, um, there. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference between supplemental use and conditional use? I don't understand supplemental. It's just the way the PCC zoning district is organized. It has the main uses are like manufacturing office and it, it requires a master development plan. Okay. And then it, it doesn't have a conditional use category. It oh. lists only like supplemental, almost support for the workers that might be in that development. Gotcha. And so it's not a primary business. It's really geared towards, um, being a groomer that an employee in the overall, you know, master planned office park could could utilize. Okay. So it, it's a little bit different, um, and it doesn't, uh, it would not accommodate, PCC doesn't have animal shelter or pet hotel listed gotcha. in it. Um, and I don't think it even has veterinary clinic. I, I can look, though. I, okay. Well. So if there's no other questions, yeah. just, I just for right. just had one. Yeah. Go ahead. So so the slide that talks about overnight, you're saying any facility that has dogs overnight, there's an attendant the entire night? That is the way it is drafted currently. Wow, that's, I think you put a great deal of thought and consideration to this, both for the residents and the animals and the owners of these facilities. Thank you, that was very time consuming. Okay. Thank you. So this is a uh, public hearing, so what we're gonna do is allow for the public to speak now. So if there's anybody that wants to speak to ordinance 17-21, um, <clears throat> please step forward, state your name and address, and you'll have uh, three minutes. Hello, everybody. James Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Um, I just came tonight to uh, say that we, we've been, several of the residents that own properties that are adjacent, directly adjacent to the proposed uh, changes, have you know, been trying to work together and with the city, and that they agree with the conditional use along there, as, as opposed to the permitted. Gotcha. So thank you. Very good, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? Step up. Yes, sir. I'm Kaufman, uh, Boynton Beach resident. I, uh, sorry. Uh, just speaking to this type of business and the people that need them. If it's not a con complete package, the dog is, it, it, the place isn't really suited for what people need it for. H has to exercise, has to be fed, has to be looked after. I think all of these ingredients go with the one business. That's really all I have to say about it. I, you know, you can't chop it up. 
one man's opinion. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. Can we get your name and your address, please? Wayne oh, Sure. Hoffman. Glenn Kaufman, uh, Belmont Place, Boynton Beach. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, Jen Grasso, 235 Northeast First Street. Um, I actually appreciate all the changes and the concept of allowing a conditional use and waiver. I think when you, it's really important. I'm a dog owner. I live in a condo. My dog needs to exercise. I need to board my dog um, as well. So one of the things, and, and I think to his point, is that it is important to have the full package for your dog. And I think it's important to take into consideration that when you're looking at the individual conditional use. One thing that has come to my attention, <laughs> I'm temporarily living in um, South, Southeast 7th and 2nd, um, is that you need to be careful when you're looking at those to approve commercial businesses. There's a handful of cottage businesses with people doing doggy daycare and boarding behind their houses um, that are not here. So, you know, when you look at it and you weigh the pros and cons, as a resident, I want to be able to take my place to a reputable business. Um, so you have to be careful about not denying things so you're going to force the cottage industry. Because I was taken back by the number of houses that are literally boarding dogs um, and having doggy daycare. I see them every morning drop off. I see them in the afternoon picking up. So I, I just ask that you take that in consideration when you get to your next steps. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Who else? Hello. Elizabeth McHugh, Southeast Third Avenue. I'm uh, very excited about what I'm hearing tonight. I think waivers and conditional use would be awesome. Um, we do, we are exploding in East Del Rey with buildings, condos, apartments, townhomes, more and more families moving in here, more and more and more dogs, and they can't all go to the two places that are there now. So I'm very encouraged by this tonight, and I hope you'll pass 1721. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Stephanie Trigg, 208 Southeast 8th Street. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, I, as a female new to business and trying to make her way in business, I think it's fantastic bringing in more business-owned, women-owned businesses. And I think that's very exciting. I think it shows a lot of... Um, a lot of progression in the city of Delray and really taking that into consideration on top of the fact that I think I've seen two new doggy stores opening up on the Ave or right off the Ave that just goes to show you how much our residents care about their furry little family friends so I ask you to please vote because I'm going to become a furry mommy again soon thank you yeah anyone else Hi there. Hi. My name's Jennifer. I'm the majority owner of Beach Dog. Jennifer, last name, please. Roselli. Okay, thank you. 820 Southeast Fifth Avenue. First, I want to commend you guys. You guys have a very hard job and you're doing great. Second, I don't need to apologize. I'm a first time business owner. My intention was never to open a business without the city's approval. There was a lot of gray area. Um, I made mistakes myself. So for that, I do apologize. It's not my intention. I'm, of course, want to rectify the situation as quickly as possible because now I'm being hit with $30,000 a month in fines with code enforcement. I will not be able to sustain in business. Um, I care about my neighbors immensely. I hope you guys take in consideration the building itself, um, where barking can be heard and where barking cannot be heard on a specific building and what the owner has done already to rectify the situation and what we are willing to do to rectify the situation. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Anybody's gonna be talking after this lady, you can, you can queue up so we don't have to wait. Thank you. I could have run up. Uh, Kathy Grossman, 705 Southeast 8th Street, Delray, uh, up a couple hundred yards from uh, Beach Dog. I have two German Shepherds. I have a husband who is a physician at Cleveland Clinic. I'm an international executive. We travel constantly. He's never home. Um, and we rely 
exclusively on Beach Dog for boarding. Uh, Jennifer is an incredible businesswoman. We're not talking about the business. I'm sorry. About the um, I think exactly what was said earlier, that we do need multifaceted services um, in a dog care facility. And um, we, um, we just hope that that consideration is made. So thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Looks like we got to everybody, so public comment is closed uh, to the commission. I'd just Any like to questions? chime in really quickly. I d uh, think we have uncovered uh, code enforcement. If we have um, businesses, perhaps illegally, being performed at single family households, uh, we have uncovered something that uh, the city should be aware of, and it's a shame that uh, this is going on. It reminds me of our uh, Airbnbs, mm -hmm. wherein businesses are started and nobody's regulating anything, and the neighbors who I would think would be lining up to say, there's a house next door, they're boarding dogs. I don't think that's legal. I'm being affected. Uh, but our neighbors are long suffering, and uh, just my two cents that we might have uncovered something that the code and the police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Entertain a motion? Well, I just wanted to oh, second what um, Commissioner Casal mentioned. It. This looks like an incredible amount of work, not only for Ms. Jellin to read <laughs> <laughs> all of that in, but obviously by Anthea yeah. and your team. And you can tell how well thought out it is and all the input from all of our boards. Um, I'd categorize our city as a, as a dog-friendly or pet-friendly city. And, uh, and it's important that we have a modern definition of support services for that community and also to, you know, protect everyone's way of life in Delray Beach as we continue to uh, engage in those support services throughout our city. So um, thank you. And uh, I make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, I'd like to quick. echo, I'd just like to echo Commissioner Boylston's comments. A lot of hard work. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Um, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And Petrolia? And yes. Okay. So moving on to um, first readings. This is Ordinance 21-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City, City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 2, Administrative Provisions, Article 2.2, Establishment of Boards Having Responsibilities for Land Development Regulations, Section 2.2.4, the Board of Adjustment, Section 2.2.4, the Board of Adjustment, to revise the board composition requirements and duties of the board of adjustment, providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, and authority to codify, and providing an effective date. And I believe this is first reading, so there is no presentation unless you have any questions. Well, this was um, just to uh, remind everybody, this was what you brought up with respect to the um, alternatives being, um, alternates being pushed into the regular. That's, that's really all, the, and it cleans up a little bit of the, of the section, but it really just makes the board a seven member board with no alternates. Very good. All right. Motion, motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. All right. We are now on the uh, public comment. I'm sorry, the comments and inquiries of non agenda items. City Manager? Nothing further at this time, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Very good. City Attorney? Nothing from me. All right. To the Commission. Anybody want to start? I see everyone packing up. I'm going to just go real quick. Just three things that were on our consent agenda that I just wanted to. Um, point out um, the law enforcement trust fund. Um, thank you for supporting our local nonprofits and mentoring our youth. Um, I saw your donation of $10,000 there uh, to the EJ, EJS project, so thank you. Um, thank you to Virginia and Harvey Kimmel Family Foundation for the grant of $300,000 um, to pay for, I believe that's two years of a salary of a service population, three years of a service population advocate. Um, so thank you very much to, uh, to that family foundation. I had an opportunity to run into them the other night, and they are very, very passionate about that position, very passionate about our city. And, um, and this is a big night, big night for them, big night for our city. Um, and, uh, and lastly, I hope to see um, my, my colleagues out, hopefully, if your schedule allows it, at the um, 
at the football game for the 50th anniversary, which we mentioned uh, mentioned tonight. It's also the homecoming game for uh, for Atlantic High School. Um, and I hope to see you out there. Go Eagles. Very good. I, I'd like to know how to get a ticket. I don't know if I just show up with my badge. <laughs> I, think you, I think if you slip in with the... Uh, the pom-pom girls? No, no, the, the group that's coming in f with the... Um, the package know, the, that comes. Exactly, okay. you can probably get in there. Right, I'll go next. I think we are busy, 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 busy. <laughs> I'd like to commend our city manager once again. I hope that we're going to keep doing this to you, uh, Mr. Moore, just thanking you so much. Um, you have taken on a great deal that half of it we don't even know because I didn't know about the disparity study coming and how you were thrown into the fray. Uh, again, I apologize for any throwing into the fray that I participated in. Um, you've done so nicely and just balls in the air uh, constantly and coming out. And the only thing I think you can do now is do a flip in the air and do a, <laughs> split. a split, thank you. There, uh, thank you, incredible. I, I appreciate it, and so very limber. If you don't even tell me, that's the sad part about it. You don't complain, and I thank you for all of that. I thank all thank of you. my colleagues for everything that we've uh, experienced since August the second. I think we're on a roll. Uh, City Manager Moore shared something. I don't. I'm not going to put it out here, but I encourage you to talk with him about his experience at one of the meetings of the city managers. And uh, I think we have a long way to go to undo what uh, the perception of the city is. And I think we're on a, on a trajectory to do just that. Thank everyone. And thank all of you for who stayed at the end of the show. Yeah. Hello, Alice. Welcome. One resident. One employee and three police officers. <laughs> Who are also employees. <laughs> um, I'll, be, I'll be quick as well. Uh, Ryan, I, I want to just piggyback on your thank yous. Um, and I was asked for an update on the uh, Coastal Habitat Conservation Plan. We're currently looking at the scope of the inventory of both the vegetation and the uh, animals. And lastly, um, I was also asked to update on the beach bucket program. And the beach buckets are in transit, so hopefully we'll have them soon. And I think there'll be buckets, buckets at every uh, entrance to the beach. So thank you. Yeah. Very good. And then finally, I just want to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. just ahead. one last thing, please. I fail to recognize that our city fire department every Tuesday is giving vaccines. And hopefully after Friday, if they approve the boosters for the vaccines, that they are going to be officially able to give them the boosters without having to go onto your computers for the senior citizens. Uh, please help spread the word for those who are having difficulty navigating the system of how do I get one, I want one. Um, I went to the um, Publix and she said, well, go online and do, and I'm saying, she doesn't even know if I know how to use a computer. Just go online, that's an automatic thing. And the older you get, trust me, you don't know how to go online if you never did it before. And there's a large segment of our community who just doesn't do that and may not have someone to do it for them. So let's spread the word, the uh, fire department, every Tuesday, 9 o'clock. And I also would like to apologize to the police department. I intended to attend your uh, recognition program today, and unfortunately something overcame it, and I decided to save my energies for tonight's meeting. Yeah. And I understand Mr. City Manager attended on my behalf. Thank you, and your behalf. And, I, and I would say thank you for being there for me, too, because I had a conflict in my schedule as well. But I just want to say a shout out to the gentleman in the fishbowl over there, Sam. <laughs> Ah, Sam. Sam, Sam Tot. I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, the great job that you guys did on the fly over at Old School Square with a life event for somebody who had right. had um, scheduled a bat mitzvah and then it had been canceled and then you guys picked up the ball and ran with it. And I have to tell you, I called the owners, I mean, I'm sorry, not the owners, the, the customers on that Sunday morning following because I just wanted to find out, did we 
meet your expectations? Did we fall short? Are, is there some credit, uh, uh, constructive criticism? This is kind of uh, a first for us being shoved into this. And there was absolutely nothing but great um, comments. Uh, you know, your team did a great job. Danielle, they called out specifically, um, was just amazing. So wanted to make sure that I mentioned that to my colleagues because I don't think everybody had the opportunity of hearing that. And thank you for, you know, stepping up, um, especially in a situation where, you know, we really didn't know we were going to have this coming. So you guys really picked up the ball and ran with it. And that says everything that we need to know about the t type of team that you have. In addition to that, I just want to make a comment that it appears to me that there is an effort to make the campus dark. Mm. And that is not, exa that's not what I want to see. I don't think it's what anybody up here wants to see on the campus of, of Old School Square. Um, you know, so I think that our, we may have an opportunity of being able to do a little bit more over there, and I think that we should. So we'll be talking about that in the future as it comes available. But um, this campus is never meant to be dark. It was never meant to be uh, non-active. And so I think that we can, we can um, make sure that through this um, kind of in-between time that we keep things going and rolling so that we have activity for especially the visitors that come in and, ex and their expectations being um, um, to the, the things that are going on, they used to go on on Old School Square. So I think that we can actually uh, pick up the ball and run with it. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of your team especially. You did a great job. So congratulations. And congratulations to you um, again, um, uh, Mr. Moore, for uh, you know having that leadership skill to be able to put into action exactly what we needed at this time. So, so appreciate it. All right, that's it. If anything else, 